is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Good morning, members, and I declare the meeting open to the public online. Can I welcome members who are participating this morning by telephone, conferencing, and this morning that is Orlea Flynn. I would like to remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. Apologies, uh, members. We have an apology this morning from uh, Pat Sheehan, and our members are aware, so we have otherwise a full attendance. Chairperson's business, then. Um, I would like to advise members that we have had to defer the June monitoring briefing due to staff sickness, so that briefing will now have to be rescheduled for members. I would also like this week in particular to acknowledge the fact that we are in Curers Week, and on behalf of the committee, just to acknowledge the absolute essential work that Curers carry out on behalf of us all and, and um, the additional pressures that they have undoubtedly been placed under as a result of COVID-19. Curers are and remain often unrecognised and uh, poorly supported in many ways, and I think the committee would be would be keen to send our appreciation to them this morning, but also to um, indicate that we, we would hope to address issues with Curers and, and with many other people around the particular COVID, COVID problems, and we have done that, and we will continue to do that. Uh, I also met with some of the Curers organisations this week. Uh, one of them was families in NA and um, will we'll hope to be doing several other engagements throughout the week in relation to profiling the difficulties and, and the contribution of carers. It's also Mental Health Awareness Week, and I think that's an issue that, that we would also be concerned about in relation to um, infant mental health. It's, it's a particular area of concern, and one I think that is of a something that, that is worthy of being promoted in terms of awareness and, and addressing those issues. We have been tweeting throughout the week to raise awareness and acknowledge the important work in both of those areas, and I would encourage members just to uh, retweet on any of those Health Committee tweets that are out there. Okay, moving on, members, now to the draft minutes. Item 3, I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 3rd of May, which are tab 3.1 of the meeting pack. Are members content with those minutes? Content. Thank you, members. Can I also refer you, members, to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 4th of May, which are tab 3.2 of the meeting pack? Are members content with those minutes? Members are content. I would like to advise members there are two matters arising from the minutes. Firstly, item 4.1 is a memo from the clerk to the clerk of the Committee for Justice forwarding the Committee for Health's views on the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, as agreed by email. Item 4.2 is a response from the Commissioner for Older People to issues which we were raised at last week's briefing. Are members content to note both of those? Okay. Yep, members are content. Okay, members, we're now moving into our first substantive briefing on the day in relation to our COVID-19 disease response work that we are currently undertaking. And we are receiving a briefing from Nikikdu this morning in, re in relation to that. That's a me coming back. May I refer members to the briefing notes at tab 5 of the main pack and correspondence at tab 5 of your table papers. I advise members that representatives from the trade unions are here, most via teleconference, to brief the committee on policy and workforce issues during the COVID-19 crisis. And I think it's important that we bear that in mind as we proceed this morning. There are many issues, and we will no doubt return to many of the issues in, in partnership with the unions. But our particular focus at this time is on uh, things that are uh, of concern or need consideration as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. So I'd like to welcome now by audio link, uh, I'll just check, Ms Anne Speed, Chair of the Nikikdu Health Committee and a member of Unison. Are you there, Anne? Good morning, Anne. Miss Clara Ronald, Vice Chair of the Nikikdu Commit Health Committee and member of the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy. Are you there, Clara? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Miss Karen Murray from the Royal College of Midwives. Karen, are you on the line? I am. Good morning. Thank you and good morning. And Miss Tanya Killen from NIPSA. Tanya, have you joined us there on the phone? 
I have indeed. Yes, good morning. You're, you're very welcome. So, and then in person here today, we have Mr. John Patrick Clayton, Clayton Policy Officer of Unison. I'd like to welcome you all very much here this morning. Um, we're very conscious that, that uh, you, you play a crucial role in terms of the delivery of, and, and design and delivery of healthcare. So I will now invite witnesses to brief the meeting. Um, Anne Speed will speak first, and then she will introduce other members of the panel. So I go ahead and invite you, Anne, to uh, give us your briefing, please. Uh, good morning, um, Assembly members and colleagues. Um, the I'm sorry, there's an echo on the line here. We're hearing not... you clear, Anne. It may be difficult for you, but there is no echo okay. here. So we're hearing you very clear at, this, at the present time. But it may, be, okay. it may be awkward for you, but we are hearing you. Fine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, just to briefly tell you that the Nicky 2 Health Committee is composed of various affiliate unions uh, to the Northern Ireland Congress of Trade Unions. And our main focus on policy development and implementation and in our work we engage with the Department of Health, the arm's length body, uh, for example the Health and Social Care Board, the Public Health Agency, etc. and uh, health care trusts on this basis. Uh, we don't engage in collective bargaining on behalf of our collective members uh, this is a process undertaken by a separate structure. However, this morning, we tried to construct our evidence into three parts. First of all, our overall concerns at a policy level, which myself, John Patrick, uh, Claire, who is our co-chair, and Karen Murray from the Royal College of Midwives, would like to participate in this discussion with the, and evidence uh, with the committee. Thereafter, there are specific health workforce planning issues, which we have invited our colleague Tanya Hillen from NIPSA to participate in the, that discussion with myself and Claire. And I think we want to conclude our evidence uh, with your agreement, uh, Chair, on the issue of social care. And we know that this has been given a lot of attention by the committee. We um, submitted evidence to you on the live-in project. We know that this took your particular attention and in that part of the evidence session we'd like to invite our colleagues from the RCN and the GMB to join us in giving that evidence and answer qu any questions you may have. The reason we structured this way was to give the different cohorts of the workforce an opportunity to participate and to make sure that we brought to your attention our broad policy concerns and the specific areas of concern for the workforce. So uh, we find ourselves a little bit at a disadvantage because of the announcement that was made on Tuesday by the Minister, where he undertook to reform the governance structures in relation to the Department of Health, and therefore brought us to a, a position where the, the policy structure we've been engaging with, the TAB structure, a transformation advisory board, um, which we believe is of major importance, and has attempted to play a significant constructive role in the transformation process, appears to have been set aside. So while we were initially encouraged by the reference uh, to Health and Wellbeing 2026 
for the need to work in partnership and bring together all relevant individuals and groups um, when changes to systems or services are suggested. We're not sure where now that conversation is going to take place. Uh, we certainly would insist that trade unions are social partners and represent the whole health and social care workforce. And that discussions on the health and care system and indeed all the major challenges that we've had to rise to in the COVID pandemic um, have underscored the importance of a partnership approach and our role in dealing with all those challenges. When we entered the COVID pandemic, we had been through a period of sustained austerity. And uh, we are aware the cost of providing care services increases by around 6% annually. And this level of investment is effectively to allow services to stand still. Uh, it was not forthcoming in the last decade and has left our members working in a service that is under-resourced and under pressure. I can tell you, uh, Assembly members, that in the last nine weeks, uh, I have engaged substantially with the infrastructural initiatives taken by the Department of Health to support the preparation of the acute sector, for example, in uh, developing COVID-focused care, dealing with the RQIA in their role as an oversight and guidance body for the social care independent sector, with the PHA in trying to define and determine guidance for our workforce, and with the health trust on a regular basis to make sure that engagement with the workforce was absolutely guaranteed. So it's been, we've been working at a mile a minute. We've been very pressed in terms of dealing with crisis issues as they emerge. We've had difficulties around complicated guidance or absence of guidance of uh, problems to do with PPE, undersupply, uh, lack of conduit between the independent sector and the public sector. Eventually, after a period of time, we acknowledge, and it happened with a great deal of support from us, that the public sector was able to wrap its arms around the independent care sector, both the domiciliary uh, care provision and nursing home provision. So we are extremely concerned that the COVID-19 pandemic will further widen health inequality in our society. It's particularly dangerous, this virus, for persons with underlying health conditions. And I'm sure the committee has heard a great deal of evidence from within the health service about the concern uh, at the slowdown in provision of general health care and the increasing number of people now on waiting lists for critical care, coronary care, cancer care. We are going to play a major role in the restart of services. And we have had briefings with the critical care team at the level of the department. And we have made some submissions to their consideration. There is anxiety 
across the workforce. We believe that there's a lack of confidence in the community in terms of entering back into uh, care in, across the health service. We actually discussed that with the employers this morning, how to make the public more confident about in, seeking care and seeking help. We've issued detailed proposals uh, of the measures that will be required in terms of health, social care, social protection, how it will impact on education, housing, poverty, the rights of workers, and taxation and public spending that should be taken to ensure a new deal as we emerge from COVID-19. There needs to be a complete and cross-departmental strategy uh, pulled together to assist the emergence out of the lockdown. I think the Health Committee and your particular scrutiny and oversight of what's happening across the health service is of primary importance and we will most certainly look to support now and in the future to the committee, ensuring this full accountability and scrutiny. Um, we're, we're getting a lot of feedback on your lane now, a lot of uh, like an echo, just there the last, the last few sentences. Can you check, can, can everyone on the lane check to make sure you're all on mute? Um, can we, Anne? Can can you hear me there now, Anne? Do, do, I can hear you now. That's oh, okay, clear. that seems that seems to be better now. So, um, I think you you were just concluding your remarks there, Anne. Um, yes. Could could you? And I'll invite. Yep. John Patrick to to add his comments and invite Claire to invite to add her comments. Okay, so we'll go then now to John Patrick here in person. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, members. I don't have an awful lot else to add. I think Anne has, has opened up the position very, very fully. Um, I suppose if it might be of interest to the committee in terms of the transformation structures um, that were established under Delivering Together, uh, Anne referred to the Transformation Advisory Board, or TAB. As the committee will be aware, TAB um, uh, sits alongside the Transformation Implementation Group, or TIG. Um, and as Anne has, has already alluded to, we have an announcement from the Minister this week and a plan in relation to rebuilding HSE services and also the, the creation of this management board. Um, I have represented the NICAC2 Health Committee on TAB since it was established by Minister O'Neill in 2017. Um, and I think possibly during, during, during your questions we can, we can get into the detail of how that, how that, is, how that has operated since then. Um, I think, as Anne has alluded to, the concern we would have is where TAB finds a place within these new arrangements. Uh, we don't yet have any clarity on that. It's not particularly clear um, from uh, the Minister's announcement or indeed from the plan itself or from the proposed changes to the HSC framework document in relation to the creation of the management board. So obviously we would have concerns in, in, in that regard and certainly speaking from the, the Unison perspective uh, and the policy officer with Unison, I think a concern we would have around the management board itself is the potential that this may become another layer of bureaucracy within, within the health service. We already have, as Anne has alluded to, commissioning, uh, a split between commissioning and providing of services. We have a number of trusts. We have a variety of HSE structures. So where the management board sits in that regard and where, where room will be found for, particularly for the voice of the workforce and the representative trade unions, I think would be, our, would be our primary concern in relation to the management board. So perhaps we'll let Claire come in there if she has any, anything she'd like to add at this stage and then we'd be, we'd be happy to take your questions. Yeah, uh, can we go across then on the phones to Claire? Claire, are you there? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Um, I don't want to add too much um, because I want to give the, the committee time to ask us any questions you think are relevant. The only thing I wanted to highlight was often what we're told when we talk about staff engagement and staff involvement is the, the, the partnership forum, the strategic partnership forum. Now, this is something that trade unions fought for for a long time. It's been in abeyance for quite a while. Um, and, and it is important that it gets up and running. It's going to be interesting to see how it will run with the, the social distancing um, because it's quite a large group um, and it's about facilitating discussion and collaboration. It's not about negotiation and it shouldn't take the place of negotiation. Instead, it's focusing much more on how we can influence the future strategic directions. So it's looking at where we want to be in four or five years' time and what decisions need to be made now that doesn't replace the decisions and, and the involvement of trade unions in what is happening here and now. So we need to be able to separate out the two of them. So the Strategic Partnership Forum is not the answer to trade union engagement in how we relaunch services post-COVID. And that's probably the only thing I would want to add at the moment. Okay, thank you, Claire. And then, are we hearing from uh, Karen or Tanya then as a presentation before we go to Q and A? Is that correct? No. Okay. Well, then I think we're going to open up now to members to to uh, uh, a question and answer session. So, I suppose the first question that I would have there in relation to the management board. Um, and in relation to, and I've noted the comments about where will the conversation take place, have there been any contacts to date at all in relation to that issue with, with Nick Ecdu or with the unions? Uh, I could answer that and say no. Uh, I think we were told about an hour before the minister was about, about to uh, make a public statement. Okay, thank you. And the other one then from me is, in, we, we heard here within, within the past number of weeks about a rapid learning initiative in relation to the care home sector, um, a sector that we all realise has, has suffered greatly as a result of this and that there are indeed rapid learning to be, to be. So I just want to check, are the unions engaged in that rapid learning initiative um, or have you had any contact in relation to that? Again, the answer is no and that's news to us, Chair. Okay, well, that, that was evidence here given that committee a number of weeks ago. So, um, okay, well, that, 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 that would be a concern, I suppose, in terms of that that, uh, that that rapid learning does need to be, the lessons need to be gleaned very, very quickly from that in order to improve any further responses in, in relation to further surges. Okay, I'm going to go across now to members. I'm going, first of all, to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron, for the first question, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for your... Uh, attendance at the committee today. Um, so I suppose the main issue is in around the, um, the newly announced strategic um, framework on rebuilding services. Uh, do you want to tell us some more about um, you know, how, you know, what's your assessment of that new um, framework and um, how does that correlate with your, your, your own document, uh, the, the blueprint that was agreed? Perhaps uh, I, if, if I could answer that, and maybe other colleagues might want to come in. Um, our initial reaction is that this looks like a, a, a centralization of existing functions, uh, bringing it more tightly together. But in terms of presenting any new opportunities, we don't see any evidence of that. But we do see evidence of um, uh, an obscuring of the role of TAB or a deletion of the role of TAB. Uh, we certainly wish the minister well, and we will work with him in a difficult period and all of the ch around all of the challenges of restarting services. Uh, we will play our full part in that. He did talk about a two-year framework for this, but there isn't any indication of where that journey is going to take us to. And unless we're part of that conversation about that journey, 
the principles of co-design and co-production in terms of a plan for the future, I can't see them being adhered to. So this is not a new blueprint for the future. And perhaps the minister might agree with us. If that is the case, we need to hear from him about how we will have that conversation and how we will develop that strategic thinking. Because, and, and, you know, new thinking and innovative thinking, because everybody at the table on that management board are the existing uh, deliverers of the service. And all we can see is that they've come together in a tighter managerial function. I can leave it to other colleagues to add to that. I think John, uh, John Patrick then. Thanks, Chair, and th thanks for the question, Deputy Chair. Um, I think all I would really add to what Anne has said is I think what isn't entirely clear either from um, the change, particularly the HSE framework, is around the future of commissioning within this new structure. Um, one reading of the of the change to the framework would seem to suggest that commissioning has, I suppose, in a sense, potentially been put on ice. So I think there's some clarity needed around that. There seems to be, on a reading of it, a suggestion that the commissioning plan that is currently in operation will effectively roll on for the next two years. Uh, and I do think there needs to be some clarity around that because obviously that could be quite a significant change to how the system as a whole operates because currently the department issues the commissioning direction and then the Health and Social Care Board issue the commissioning plan and the, and the trusts implement that. Now, I think as, as trade unions, we've always taken the view uh, that we wanted to see the abolition of the commissioner provider split. We thought that was a layer of bureaucracy and in terms of the resources of the health service was not the best use of the health, health services resources. So we would have wanted to see a much flatter structure across, across the board, uh, much more around a public health model, which certainly given the context of COVID is arguably even more important than it ever was. So I think for this committee, uh, th that might be uh, an issue to, to explore further with the department and with the minister more specifically. I think to add to Anne's point in relation to uh, engagement, as, as I alluded to earlier, there is that lack of clarity about, about TAB. Um, and TAB, when it was established by Minister O'Neill under Delivering Together, was to play an advisory role with, to the minister. Uh, the, the minister was, was, to, was to, to be at the TAB meetings, and obviously at that time we then went through a period where there was no minister. Um, minister Swan has come in in January. Uh, alongside the other TAB members, we, we sought engagement with the minister, and a meeting was agreed, and then because of the pandemic, that meeting has been postponed. So I think um, clarity around the future role of TAB is, is very, very important, and there is potential for TAB to play a very constructive role, we would feel and it hasn't really had the opportunity to do that in the fullest sense yet because there hasn't been a minister in post for several years. So I think that, that, is, that is very, very important going forward for the reasons that Anne has alluded to as well, in that on this management board structure, from what we can see, it does seem somewhat narrow in its construction, in a sense. It is chief executives of trusts, it is um, senior officials from the department, and so on. So I think uh, it is important to think about how the voice of the workforce can, can can feed into those conversations because that is integral to the principle of co-production and co-design that is at the heart of, of delivering together. And from a union perspective, partnership working is something we wanted to see move from being sort of at the fringes of the system where you might have individual programmatic areas where unions are involved in partnership working. And from the unison perspective, that's something we've pioneered over a number of years with, with individual trusts and with some independent sector providers. Something like that needs to be much more mainstream within the system as a, as a whole. Thank you. Okay. And just in relation to the commissioning, uh, John Patrick, are you saying that the commissioning that the commissioning model you believe is being rolled out? I'm not clear what you mean by that. I, I, I suppose, Chair. I mean, I, I, it's difficult to think at this stage. Um, this is on an initial reading of the framework document that that that, uh, that I that I was undertaking last night in advance of appearing before the before the committee. The, the change seems to suggest that, on my reading, and I think clarity even is needed around this point, that the the 1920 commissioning plan, in a sense, will carry on, uh, and the delivery, the delivery targets, and the and, the, and the, the targets that are set for trusts under the commissioning plan will probably be revised in light of COVID, which seems 
certainly, I suppose, in, in one sense, understandable and in light of the resources that are available. But it, it's not entirely clear whether there will be a further period of commissioning over the next two years. Um, so I think that in itself is something that needs to be considered. And I think the other issue that needs to be considered in that context is that, as the committee will be aware, the intention was to close the Health and Social Care Board. That was a decision that was taken, if I recall correctly, initially by Minister Hamilton uh, in 2015. And then Minister O'Neill, when, when she was in post, um, I think supported that. Um, and that obviously plays a very important uh, role around commissioning because it's the Health and Social Care Board which develops the commissioning plan. So the framework document makes reference to the proposed closure and the future of the Health and Social Care Board. So it's in that sense I think there needs to be some clarity as to as to what we're looking at in the future around around commissioning. Okay, yeah, and we can we can follow that up then. So I'm going to go across the room now to Colin for a question. Um, yeah, thank you very much, and thank you to the panel for for the presentation. I suppose whenever I reflect back on on where we are, you, know, you go right back, you've delivering better services, Compton reports, Bangoa reports, we've TIGs, we've TABs, and now we have a management board. And I think if we hear board, forum, panel, or review one more time, I think people's heads are going to explode in terms of all the information. But I feel like we end up being report and uh, almost board heavy, but action light uh, from, from the department. And if we look at the department itself, we've got are, are the health structure, there's the health and social care board, there's trusts, there's the department, there's the public health agency, there's commissioning bodies. And to me, it seems like there should be management, staff and public, and that the three should work together in what they're doing. And we have this announcement of the management board, and it doesn't feel like, for example, the allied professions are represented on it at all. Um, and what any experience that I've had of the past, whenever these boards are set up, it's sort of inter our intra department where all their own little officials get together and then you have to fight with them to be able to get the other agencies and the staff and the views from the ground onto that. Do you feel that this management board is going to be like that, that we're going to have to, we're going to, have to fight to be able to make sure that the allied professions, which is what, 13 different agencies that have just been ignored um, in this management board, how are their views going to be heard? How are the views of those staff that have worked so hard through COVID going to actually be heard and reshaped, or are we just going to end up with this being another management board report that goes on the shelf in, in a year's time? What would be the trade union's views on that? Chair, can I suggest that Chair Ronald, who represents the Allied Health Professionals, responds to that? Yes, go ahead, Claire. Yeah, thank you so much for, for, for picking up on that, that huge gap that, that exists. I mean, as Anne and John Patrick have said, that the, the, the framework document is still something we're working our way through. Um, it's still quite new to us. Obviously, we only got it on, on Tuesday. But as, as others have already said, it feels as though that management board is replicating existing structures and not looking at transformation. And if we look at the response to COVID at the moment, our allied health professions have been front and foremost in that. And they're going to be front and foremost to the, the next steps and to that rehabilitation of COVID patients, to the patients who have not had care while we've been dealing with the acute care of COVID. And yet they sit nowhere on that board. Now, the CNO does a fantastic job and allied health professions kind of sit under her remit. But to expect the CNO to sit on that group, to represent nursing, which is the largest professional group, and then to represent 13 diverse professional groups underneath that, we don't think is appropriate. Those 13 groups need to have a seat and have a voice. We're the third, if, if you take all allied health professions together, we're the third largest professional group in health and social care in, in the acute and, and community side of that. And yet we have no voice. The trust chief executives will be going back to their trust boards, where again allied health professionals come under nursing, so we're further removed and further away. So I, I, it would be, it would be certainly some of the union's views that if you want to seek transformation, you need to have that board in a different way. Okay. Um, and I think Karen might want to come in on this as well. Yep. Go ahead, Karen. Thank you. Um, I, I suppose my, my concern is when I, I read through the strategic framework um, document, there is no mention of maternity services within it at all, um, nor is there really any mention of the impact of the COVID emergency on the maternity services. 
So we, we had a maternity strategy that ran from 2012 to 18, which involved significant work developing midwifery-led services, which have largely been dismantled as a result of COVID. The free, three freestanding midwifery-led units were all stood down. Um, Causeway maternity services were closed to facilitate the paediatric surge plan um, and looks as if there are some difficulties around re-establishing that service. Um, and I have concerns around a future maternity strategy. Um, I, I think following on from other points, um, if we are taking a public health approach to health services moving into the future, maternity services have to be central to that through preconceptual care, birth, um, and the first thousand and one days. That is how we will deal with both the, the social, economic, and physical aspects of public health. Um, and, I, and I have a significant concern that, yet again, maternity services feels as if it's, it's on, the, on the periphery and not actually being considered um, as, a, as a central part of this. Thank you. And maybe just at the end, we maybe I think we as a committee should be writing to the Minister and the Department and saying that those allied professions need to be represented in that management board or else it's just going to become too narrow. But I'll maybe bring that up at the end. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and, and I do think, and I think it's a missed opportunity in that, in that sense, and that sure. you know, to do things differently, we need you need to have a broad input, including from service user voices and, and cures, and you know, there's lots of other uh, perspectives that should be and would be of value to be. So I think that's that's relevant. Okay, I'm going to go then to Paula. Um, thank you, um, panel, for coming this morning. Um, during the um, pandemic, I think all. Of us MLAs have found it very useful to hear directly from the frontline workers in terms of um, the working conditions, etc. You, you mentioned in your briefing Anne, that you have you have had briefings on this um, rebuilding um, process and that you've made su submissions off the back of that. Just to take a step back a bit, how have you been able to communicate with the department during the pandemic in terms of feeding in concerns about um, the welfare of workers and any feedback that you have any submissions you've made, you know, whether they've been responded to positively or not. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, I probably, Chair, brings us to the second part of our evidence, which is to do with the particular needs of the workforce. Uh, and in our evidence, we highlighted a number of headings on this, and I'd like to refer to them, but first to answer um, the member's uh, question. We have had a weekly dial-in with the department at which the HR directors attended. And as the issues emerged, we sought and received, sometimes with delay, responses. So that allowed us to raise a number of questions under the headings that's in our um, submission today, like testing, PPE, the impact of COVID on BAME workers, etc. We also engaged and I did in particular with the external agencies I mentioned earlier, like the RQIA, PHA, Chief Medical Officer, Chief Nursing Officer. And as the surge emerged, there were a lot of questions to be answered. So we had a, a portal for urgent responses. It worked in some instances, it didn't in others. So it's been patchy, but that's how we've been able to engage. But that only emerged after we insisted on having a quick access channel. And we had to press for that. And eventually we got it. So that's how we dealt with and have been dealing with all these issues. But the workforce concern um, 
continued on from the dispute period we had, where we had hundreds of vacancies. So the challenges are we have to convert temporary posts to permanent posts. Safe staffing is a huge challenge, and we haven't been able to really, we haven't been able to progress that. The reduction and elimination of exorbitant levels of agency spend. And then moving on, we've had to engage in extensive discussion around uh, frequently asked questions, documentation that has to be cascaded to the workforce, uh, risk assessment strategy, health and safety concerns, testing, and we had to press very hard to ramp testing up, particularly for workers in the independent sector. We had to make many, many challenges on PPE, problems with the types of PPE availability, some shortages, and all of those issues, in, and as I mentioned, the BAME concerns, they're the kind of workforce issues that now we have to get resolved and we have to get real progress. If the restart of services that the minister was, is, is working to, to lead is safe and effective and that the public feels confident and has confidence in the the availability of services and the, and the number of workers to deliver these services, uh, this is going to be crucial. I think the social care issue in particular, a social worker's role in that has been very problematic. So I'd like to, after the, if, if the member is satisfied with the response, suggest that we invite Tanya in to address that, but perhaps uh, Member Bradshaw would like to continue questions. No, I, no, I was, I was satisfied with that. I'm happy to, to move on to Tanya, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Yes, Tanya, could you go ahead there, please? Yes, uh, thank you very much. And thank you on behalf of Nipsa for the opportunity to address some of these uh, community workforce um, issues. We're all aware that uh, COVID-19 has created a profound shock to society and has presented the most challenging and complex set of issues ever to face the health service, both for the employers and for uh, the employees. Key workers, as we all know, have been the heroes of this pandemic. For weeks, people have tipped to the streets, clapping with care workers, and I note you in your introduction, Chair, uh, about carers. And also for shop workers, refuge collectors, postal service, education service, and rightly so. But unfortunately, very little has been heard about those who every day are working to protect and safeguard the most vulnerable in our society, our social workers, our social care workers, and the admin workers who support them and who are the backbone of the health service. Next, along with our sister trade union, want to impress upon the employers the public and the yourselves that the NHS is not the only hospital trust. It really says me to quote that social workers, social care workers and admin members in the community report feeling like second class citizens, feeling undervalued, an afterthought, and playing second fiddle to colleagues in the acute side of the health service. And this is premised on the unacceptable delays in guidance and advice and insufficient PPE in the early days of the pandemic. Social work and social care are extremely passionate about the role, and they're incredible in their depth, their perseverance, their persistence, and the response to people in need. The jobs are already stressful, and these have been exacerbated tenfold by COVID-19. And COVID-19 has increased the pressures on the children and families, and it's also the early days of work with social care. Karen, sorry, Karen, can I just interrupt you there? There is now, uh, that feedback has come back onto the line. Can I ask all members who are not speaking to ensure that you're placed on mute? 
And Karen, you were a little faint there. Anyway, if you could maybe hold the phone up a wee bit closer or something, it was just a little hard to hear. It's Tanya chair. So, yeah. It's Tanya chair, sorry. Tanya, sorry, Tanya. Sorry, Tanya. Tanya. My, my mistake there, Tanya. Uh, so, so uh, other members, please just ensure you're on mute, and Tanya then, please carry on. Okay. Um, I'm saying that the COVID-19 has increased pressures on vulnerable children and families, and it's also impacted on the way that social work and social care are able to interact and support them. Um, there's been no doubt that social workers and uh, social care workers have had to make radical changes and adaptation to the way that they've carried out their duties. However, they have felt vulnerable and exposed by the minimal, minimal safeguards when direct client contact um, has been limited, which has made assessments very difficult and they struggle with the knowledge that they're discharging patients from hospital without sufficient care packages or into homes that have had an adequate PPE, and we're all aware of those issues. And sadly, the impact of this crisis for both adults and child protection is likely to be felt long after the threat of the virus itself is defeated. Going forward, there needs to be some public acknowledgement of the valuable work that these staff undertake, and there must be assurances that they're not left carrying the responsibility for gaps in the system. As the committee will be aware, prior to the pandemic, the trade unions were engaged in industrial action in relation to safe staffing. There were 500 social work vacancies and 1,000 admin vacancies. COVID-19 in many ways has masked these difficulties as services have been stepped down and activity has dropped. However, as they're being re-established, these staffing issues will emerge with a vengeance. And has already made mention of it. Frontline vacancies have already had a detrimental impact on patient care and staffing. It's compromised the safety of staff and patients alike, and it's contributed to the long waiting list and added pressures on the workforce. Vacancies are going to increase due to people either shielding or off ill, which will add additional pressures onto services. There's already been a serious recruitment issue that the pandemic will worsen. Unfortunately, the NHS has become a very and extremely risky place to work, and urgent action is needed to rectify this situation. I think it's, it, it is crucial to point out that low pay lies at the root of the equipment and the detention crisis. And going forward, that there needs to be some serious and committed engagement regarding the volume of vacant posts, the delays in recruitment, training, career progression, work-life balance. And social work needs to be at the fore and an intrinsic part of any decisions that will impact on the fabric of society for the years to come. That will be much more rewarding to our members than a clap. Another issue just that I would like to uh, bring to the members' attention is the scale and compl complexity of issues facing our members in residential childcare. Our members report on a daily basis risk-taking and non-compliant behaviours from a cohort of young people. While there's no doubt there is most are trying to avoid COVID risks through compliance with the government direction, there are um, concerningly some young people who are weaponising COVID both with their peers and with staff. And examples that our members have given us are the young people coughing deliberately towards staff or spitting at staff, um, and these key facts, these scenarios are key factors in the spiraling levels of absence due to self-isolation and other stress-related conditions. It nips this view that an unambiguous fear from the department in relation to the public protection agenda related to young people who are deliberately putting themselves or other at risk is absent, and this needs to be rectified. We believe that there's a compelling duty for the department to act as on a reinterpretation of the duties of the children order in a way that can ensure trust can continue to act as responsible parents, in fact, as well as just in theory. It's both in terms of public protection and to promote the safety of children and young people in care who have, we must say, a reasonable expectation that health trust will endeavour to protect them from the COVID risk rather than exposing them to precarious risks as current policies, which we believe in effect do so. Um, and it's important that active risk, risk management rather than risk 
mitigation or containment that is absent from the department's guidance. And again, we feel very strongly that this needs to be a focus. Um, also, we, we feel that the guidance doesn't address issues of staff required um, to take sleep-ins as part of their shift, which is a major um, oversight, and it further exposes staff. Um, I think our views on that would be very well known, that there is a health and safety risk in relation to these sleep-ins. And I suppose just on the issue of the establishing of services, it's critical that issues of PPE tests and social distancing is at the fore to deal with the return of staff to work environments. Um, and on that point, it certainly nips its view that our health and wellbeing centres are not fit for purpose in this regard. One other issue just that I would like to briefly mention is, and which isn't normally in the remit of trade unions, but is childcare. Childcare has been extremely challenging during these times, um, obviously with people who would normally have used possibly parents, older parents who are shielding um, daycare facilities that have been closed. So going forth and in preparation for people returning to the workplace, it is our view that it is something that uh, has to be addressed very seriously. Otherwise, we, I mean, we already have 700 people in the Belfast Trust, for instance, that are off shielding. So the numbers then on the returns, those that are working from home, schooling from home, um, <clears throat> is going to be even more significant. So it is an issue that will have to be addressed. Okay, thank you. I leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tanya. I'm going to go very quickly to Pam, the Deputy Chair, there for a point, and then I'm going to go across to the phone to our Leah, and I then have Jerry and Alex in the room and Alan. So, uh, if I could go quickly to Pam there, please. Yep. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I just want to ask in terms of staffing, uh, certainly I, I should declare an interest as having a family member who's a nurse, uh, first of all, uh, but I wanted to ask what um, what conversations you as as unions have had with both staff and the department in terms of ensuring that that uh, staff who have been upskilled at very short notice with very little training and put into the most um, dangerous and vital work and I'm thinking in terms of the uh, as ICU for as an example dealing with the most seriously ill COVID patients. What conversations, if any, have been go ongoing? with the department and with staff members to ensure that they are getting the appropriate um, pay scale in terms of banding? Uh, if I could come in on that, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, ourselves and the RTN, we have significant nurse membership and there are parallel conversations around the utilisation of student nurses, the new intake, their terms and conditions, contracts of employment, the skill levels that are being required. So that's an ongoing process. It's uh, a bit slow moving, but nevertheless, it is incurring, and we are keeping a very close focus on that. Could I just Thank you. ask, um, does that include um, you know, going from one band to the other in terms of um, high dependency unit into ICU, which I know there's a different a differentiation in the pay bands, but it's, it's very similar or actually the same work, certainly has been during COVID? Yes, and this is an issue that has come up in a couple of the acute sites, and that discussion has commenced. So we are we are trying to deal with that through farming structures. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going across now to Orlea on the phone. Orlea, are you there? And do you have a question? Yes. Um, thank you, Chair. Maybe just before my question, I'd just like to make a point to um, Claire, who had spoke earlier about um, the rehabilitation uh, work streams. So we did ask the minister um, when he was up in front of the committee last week. I think it was. Um, if he would be following um, the approach in, in Scotland and Wales with um, appointing the, the chief allied health professional officer, you know, to lead on that piece of work. So his answer was a wee bit vague, but he did say that they were looking into it. And um, I followed that up with a written question, but I agree with 
Colin, um, I'd be more than happy if, if the committee want to follow up, um, you know, with a, a written letter or whatever, just to try and get you some more detail around that. Um, so, and then my question is around the issue of the um, the, the safe staffing. I know um, certainly within my own constituency, um, we've had plenty of queries from overworked staff members with concerns around safe staffing. And for me, whenever I was reading your report in the, the committee text, um, there was a line on page 57 that, that really stood out for me, and it was this. Um, you said that it is clear that workforce planning and engagement has not been sufficiently mainstreamed into the transformation programme and in the, the work streams that are overseen by TIG. So I'm just wondering, are you concerned that this is going to continue to be the case or maybe even possibly worsen under the new management board and what in your view could be done to improve on this and to give your members the confidence that the new management structures are going to treat this issue as a priority. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will answer that and tell you that in the burden structures these issues have come to the fore. We came out of a dispute period and we had commitment to engage in a, a process of negotiation that was suspended in the last two weeks. We demanded that that comes back on screen and actually at a meeting this morning with the department, we've insisted on getting some dates now for conversation and discussion around those issues. Filling posts. Uh, developing risk assessment strategies, dealing with childcare, and all of those important supports that the workforce would need to restart services. If we don't get prompt and quick responses from the department, restart will be delayed. So I think the scrutiny of the committee in terms of the length of time it takes get responses and are the department is the department responding promptly enough certainly could be of assistance to us chair could i just maybe make a brief comment there there yep. also um in relation to the 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 point around transformation and, and workforce planning i think there have been several examples over the over the last three years um that i could think of and certainly colleagues i think claire may well be able to think of think of some points here as well where major policy initiatives have been brought forward by the department around the reorganization of services, for example, uh, stroke services, breast assessment services. And uh, certainly from, from my perspective, what they have not been accompanied with is an actual sort of detailed analysis of what the workforce requirements are and workforce planning around that. A lot of these reorganizations often seem to be motivated by uh, a, a general comment that our staff are spread too thin across too many sites or we don't have enough staff or we're not able to grow the workforce sufficiently. So that obviously goes back to the overall point about a lack of workforce planning going back over many years that's got us to the, the, the place where we are, but then a lack of real substantive analysis of what are the implications for the workforce in terms of service reorganization. So it's absolutely, as Anne has alluded to, it's something that is being, being looked at through our bargaining structures, but it's also a major policy development issue as well. I think the department can, can put itself in a position where it, it thinks about policy changes or service reorganizations, and the workforce piece sometimes, I think, gets a little bit neglected or overlooked, and that's absolutely vital. I think that, that, that's got to be the, the very, very initial stages of the conversation, and that's what we've always tried to impress upon the department in those, in those four as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going across now to Jerry. Uh, thanks, Chair. Morning, panel. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, just to say, Chair, I'm a member of Unite uh, for the for the record uh, and for the discussion. Um, just want to ask uh, about care homes. Uh, there's a lot of talk about, obviously, the independent sector, uh, but there's a view that uh, the independent sector relies heavily on the state uh, in terms of getting finance uh, from trusts from the department, um, and there's there's a concern about that generally. Uh, but I would like to ask. Um, maybe Anne in particular, um, around care homes. Uh, is there a concern about certain care homes either not recognising trade unions or obstructing trade unions? And how does that tie into uh, people being able to safely raise health and safety uh, concerns? 
uh, and then just just finally um, around sort of transformation or even a return to normal services. Um, is there a concern that there there may be an over reliance on the use of private sector organisations, either through agency uh, staff or, or, or other outlets? Um, and is there a concern that the NHS isn't always the first port of call when it comes to the commission of services? Um, so those points. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll go across to the panel now for a response. Okay, um, it, if I take that question. Uh, first of all, we did note the Minister's response in the Assembly uh, discussion on Tuesday in answer to a question that he doesn't intend to initiate a privatisation programme. So that was reassuring, and I hope that the full management board adheres to that approach. Um, from the point of view of bargaining, collective bargaining and negotiations in the independent sector, there has been reluctance and indeed at times downright hostility to the presence of trade unions in domiciliary care provision and also in the care home sector. So we have called for and um, Unison has focused on this substantially, a bargaining forum. We've called on the minister to lend his authority and give some leadership to this and initiate such a forum in which the employers, uh, the department may be present from the point of view of funding arrangements and overall policy and trade unions who have membership in that sector would be present. This is absolutely essential if we are going to lift standards, if we're going to lift the uh, profile of the workforce, if we're going to give them the respect and the recognition that they deserve. So the right to collective bargaining and the, and the obligation as far as we're concerned <coughs> Of, on the employers to recognise the right of workers to negotiate for themselves has to be achieved. We cannot continue on in the environment we're in. And I found it especially difficult when we were attempting to uh, reach agreement around uh, support for the home. Uh, we put a lot of effort into agreeing a policy of support with the DOH uh, for a sector that was refusing to talk to us. But we did the right thing. We supported the department in offering public provision and support inside the homes who were having difficulty. We endorsed the call for support from PPE. We think we contributed significantly to the uh, award of additional funding from the minister and I think the employers have to give due regard now to the role that trade unions have played. Uh, we do have other things to say, Chair, in relation to the independent sector and I leave it to your direction to when you want us to uh, offer those views because our colleagues from the RCN and the DMB are present here this morning and they will want to contribute. Yes, I think we, we should maybe bring those into the next session. Maybe it would be, would be better. Yep, so that's that's okay. Um, okay, I, I'm and actually, Jerry reminded me there, I should have declared my own interest in, in terms of my previous career as a social worker, but also um, that I am a member of NIPSA and that I'm on a career break from, from one of the trusts here. So. Um, so I'm going then now to Alex for a question. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm just trying to get to the bottom of the Transformation Advisory Board. Um, I note there was a meeting to be held on the 24th of March, and that's been cancelled because of COVID, which is understandable. Um, has there been any meetings of TAB since the Assembly got back up and running at all? Um, were there any meetings when the Assembly was suspended? And was there any meetings before the assembly was suspended? Because I just want to see how effective it was. Sure. Um, my other question: I'm sensing, and I can be cor 
corrected if you want, but I'm sensing that there seems to be a, a great deal of frustration um, from yourselves at the, the lack of engagement. Um, um, and I know issues like PPE and testing, the responses you're getting are very slow to get to you. And also the concerns about the clarity on commissioning if the, the, the health board closes and the, the lack of um, concerns being addressed about the maternity strategy. So am I correct in reading from your tone that there is a huge frustration about the lack of consultation and engagement going on with you? Just to make sure I'm correct. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I have John Patrick then indicated. Perhaps, perhaps, if, perhaps if I maybe just deal with the, the tab issues first, if that would be helpful, and then Anne and colleagues might come in more generally about, about engagement on PPE and the other issues you've, you've raised. Um, on tab, um, just by way of context, so tab was established by Minister O'Neill in 2017, and uh, the Nick Act 2 Health Committee was invited to nominate a representative to that, and that was myself. Um, and tab also has representatives in the community and voluntary sector and in terms of patient and service user experience on it. So it is very much rooted within the idea of um, public and personal involvement. There's a statutory duty around that, but also about co-production and partnership. There was one meeting of TAB, uh, the, ex the exact date eludes me right now, but I, th I think it was in February of 2017 uh, when Minister O'Neill was still in post uh, with the Minister. Um, and then obviously we, we went into an assembly election in March of that year and the assembly didn't sit for, for several years, as, as we all know. During that period where the assembly wasn't sitting, uh, departmental officials were inviting us to take part in meetings with them. Uh, they were more informal, I suppose, in a sense, in that it was generally an opportunity for officials to share information with us as TAB members and to hear points of view from us on particular, on particular issues that they, they raised with us. We also had the opportunity to ask them about specific issues and to raise specific agenda items. Um, more generally, I think, in terms of TAB and the transformation programme, the transformation programme was split into a, a wide number of work streams. So there was, there was certainly well over 30, I, I believe. Um, some of that was being funded through the, the, uh, the DEP Conservative Confidence Supply monies. Uh, there, was a, there was 100 million a year for two years that was being used specifically to fund transformation. So there were many, many work streams coming off um, that some of which we had the opportunity to contribute to and where our views were sought as trade unions, others where uh, they weren't. Um, generally, there was, we would have gone and sought the opportunity to intervene in those work streams where we felt we, we wanted to or needed to. Um, so I suppose TAB has been a very useful structure in the absence of a minister in that it's the opportunity to raise general issues of concern, seek clarity on, on the general policy direction under transformation that, that existed in the absence of a minister. Um, I think it could play a very constructive role going forwards uh, in that um, with a minister in post, it would be an opportunity to directly advise the minister uh, and, and to, to give the minister advice um, and to scrutinise some, some of the major policy initiatives that are, that are coming forward and alongside the partnership forum that we referred to initially, which is the, the, the minister, the trade unions and the employers. Um, to go to your question about TAB has not met um, in a number of months. It hasn't met with Minister Swan. That meeting was, was postponed. And I think, um, certainly from my perspective as, as someone on TAB, that there is a need for some clarity in relation, to, in relation to where we move forward from here. I think the Minister made some reference to it in the Assembly on Tuesday and how that structure was being, was being reviewed. But I, I think there is an opportunity for it to play a very constructive role. And certainly, what, what I have tried to do and what colleagues have tried to do when we've engaged with the department is encourage them to have a much more consistent method of engagement with trade unions and with the workforce on transformation issues. It has worked quite well in some instances. Um, as you know, there's an ongoing situation with the emergency department at Daisy Hill that obviously has COVID has, has lent itself to that. But prior to that, um, there was a Pathfinder project that was established locally that had trade union representation on it. And I think that was a constructive process in, in terms of what was being planned for Daisy Hill and what the way forward needed to be for that for that area. So there are models there that we would try and promote to the department around engagement with trade unions. And do you maybe or, or colleagues want to come in on, on the, the wider point about engagement? Uh, I'd like to ask Claire to contribute, but just to set for the record, um, 
we do have engagement on what we call the bargaining issues, terms and conditions for the workforce, workforce planning, through the workforce directorate in the Department of Health. I think they have problems getting responses from the policy lead and other parts of the Department of Health. So I'd like Claire maybe to respond to that. Yeah, we, have someone, we have someone there who is, maybe it is Claire that's not on mute, but we certainly, have, we certainly are picking up on some of the child care issues. I was going to say, Chair, we refer to child care issues we're all, juggling, we're all juggling with those. Someone else that needs to be on mute. Absolutely. Go ahead, Claire. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think to pick up just briefly on the the, the PPE issues and the testing, because that tends to come under our um, negotiation group. Um, I'm just going to wait while others mute themselves. We have a, a, a dog barking there in the background as well. Maybe. <laughs> we're, we're picking up on that, so I'm just not sure if that's if that's clear. If 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 everyone puts hashtag six there, if we're putting on a mute, star sign, sorry, star six. If you put your phone on mute, that is clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But could everyone just check that their phone's on mute there and do star six? That sounds better now. Go, go again there, Claire, please. Claire, yeah, I think when it comes to some of the there? PPE... Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you there, okay, yes. Yeah. Um, I think when it comes to some of the PPE and testing, as Anne says, we have regular meetings as the negotiating group with, with the Workforce Department and with HRD. And I think we have to be fair to them because sometimes their answers are delayed because of the systems we're working in. Um, so, so some things um, are out with our control. So if we take, for example, quarantine, which Westminster suddenly introduced, which will have impact on us. And so we're still trying to work through some of that. So, so the kind of workforce side of things, we're, we're, we're building on those, on those relationships and working through that. I think, as John Patrick was saying, it's that wider kind of as we transform. And that almost brings us back to, to the, the announcement on Tuesday and where does staff side sit within that and that we're still having to work through that. So as we're rebuilding services, as we're transforming services, where is the strategic voice for the trade unions within that as the voice of our members? And that sometimes seems to be lacking. And then the, the sort of tying up of actually integrating workforce planning into any of these transformations that they're bringing through. Okay. Hopefully that answers that. Thank you. And going across then to Alan. Okay, thank you, Chair. I, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to pay tribute uh, to the uh, uh, contribution that has been made by the workforce that uh, you all represent in, in dealing with this pandemic. It, it's, it's certainly demonstrated uh, their dedication to ensuring the health and well-being uh, of the public. Uh, in the uh, paper presented to us uh, this morning, uh, I note that you say that uh, due to your intervention, uh, testing has intensified across the care home sector to the extent that a programme has now been introduced to test all residents and staff across all uh, care homes. Uh, you also said you still require clarity from the department as to how frequent such testing will be. And certainly, maybe as uh, recently as a fortnight ago, the chief medical officer, I asked him about this, the frequency, and, and I don't think a final decision had been made. But could I ask, what would be your preferred frequency uh, of such testing to all residents and staff in the care home sector. Thank you. And across to the panel, please. Uh, if I could answer that and say that we could give an answer to that based on the evidence of what has happened to date inside the care home. We have asked for a report on uh, the testing strategy we've asked for a presentation to be made to us. In relation to the care homes in particular, we are not, we don't have to hand data as to what exactly is the situation inside the care homes now. And that goes to the point that we need to be involved at the level of 
policy development around what's going to happen with the care homes in the future. Uh, and we need access to that data. I know the RQIA is collecting data on what is happening, the PHA, but they haven't shared that information with us. We do think we have a right to that information because it's our workforce, our members, and indeed our families and our community are inside those work, those care homes. So um, I think it's an important question, and I think all of us will need the data, you know, to make the right judgment about what's required going going forward. I was very glad because to see the, the increased emphasis on testing, because I was involved in discussion with the RQIA a number of weeks ago and made various interventions about uh, patients going from hospital to their home, of the delay for care home staff in test results coming back. Within the trust, it was 24 hours. In the, in the testing facility for the care home staff, it was 72 hours. But all of that over time has been improved. I have to acknowledge that. But they were initial problems. So if we're planning now for the next phase, we need the data, we need the analysis, and all of us need to see it. And just a follow up by Tim. The Commissioner for Older People is calling for frequency of twice a week and bearing in mind that uh, this test is quite an unpleasant and quite an invasive test, um, would you protect the right uh, of the uh, workers that you represent if they were not happy uh, with presenting themselves, say, on a twi twice weekly basis to have such uh, a maybe invasive test carried out on them? Well. Obviously, we would have to consult with the workforce who are our members, and we cannot ignore their concerns. We need to have access to the staff as well to have that conversation. And that's where the issue of the closed door from the care home owners uh, comes into play. Where we can, we will consult, but some doors are closed and they need to be opened. Okay, thank you, and thank you, panel, for th for that session, which I think uh, we've, we've all found very interesting and informative and useful. Um, I'm going to take uh, well, well. First of all, I just want to um, formally state that there has been a suggestion that we would write to the to the minister in relation to the engagement on the on the management group in relation to the. Uh, the, the gaps in engagement across some of those allied health professionals. So I think members are agreed, generally members are agreed that, that we will do that. And I also think we will uh, engage uh, maybe around the issue of, of overall engagement, responsiveness to your quest, you know, issues that those are those areas are considered and improved upon if possible. So I'm going to thank uh, the members who, who, are, who are leaving now, and then I'll invite the other members to stay on. We're going to do a, a short break in order to get the, other, the additional two members onto the line. So I'll, I'll wish you all the best for now, and we'll welcome the others back in a few minutes. And members, could I suggest that we come back again at 12 and resume at 12 o'clock? Thank you. Welcome back, members. And I, we we are now moving into our second substantive briefing from the unions this morning in relation to the Safe at Home initiative. Can I refer members to tab six of your pack and table papers at tab six also? I can advise members that representatives from Unison, GMB, and the Royal College of Nursing are here, most via teleconference, to brief the committee on the Live In Cure Homes pilot Safe at Home announced by the Department of Health on the 15th of May 2020. So I'd like to welcome now um, to our meeting Ms Anne Speed from Unison, Mr Alan Perry from the GMB, Ms Rita Devlin from the Royal College of Nursing, and in person in the room we have John Patrick Clayton from Unison. So I would like to now invite members of our panel to go ahead and brief the committee, please. Okay. Uh 
Thank you very much, everybody, for this opportunity to brief you. And we have been very aware of the very close attention that the members of the committee have placed on this important sector of the workforce and your particular concerns as to what has been happening inside the care homes. As of yesterday, I understand that there has been, there hasn't been any application to participate in the project. And I checked that with the department. And at this stage, we're not sure if any such project is ever going to be underway. For the record, I think it will be important to uh, elaborate and to answer questions on what we felt were the problems with the project as presented to us. Uh, when we couldn't give agreement to it, the department decided to write to the care home owners directly and invite them to apply. So that was not really acceptable to us, but it was a fait accompli and not much we could do about it. I'd like to ask Rita Devlin to come in and go through the broad points of our objections and concerns and share if it's acceptable to you then at an appropriate time. I and uh, other colleagues would like to make some general comments on the care home sector and some questions we think have to be answered if we are going to make a proper plan going forward to support this sector and look after the residents, the patients, and the workforce. So I'd like to suggest Rita addresses you now. Yeah, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go ahead and hear from Rita, and then I'll ask you to make those uh, remarks as briefly as possible, please, in relation to the wider issues, and then we'll move into a question and answer session. So we'll go ahead then with Rita, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Anne. Um, the Royal College of Nursing and Janison and GMB um, welcome the opportunity to clarify um, our position on the Safe at Home pilot. Um, we would like to make it clear that we never refused to work with the Department of Health on it. However, we had some um, very um, serious issues with what was being proposed. The aim of the project was to implement a system whereby staff would live in care homes for a defined period to reduce the number of contacts and opportunities for infection. Uh, and we were pre presented with the paper and we give our um, responses to that. We were concerned that given that we have known for some time that the death rate among older people, the um, older population was significantly higher with COVID-19, we were concerned that a more proactive approach had not been adopted at an earlier stage in the pandemic to reduce the risks to vulnerable patients. At, since the onset, RCN members and Unison members and GMB working within nursing homes have received conflicting advice and guidance about PPE. And given the recognised risk associated with these patients, it is regrettable that this arrangement for supply of PPE to nursing homes were not considered a priority in the early COVID planning. Introduced in the rationale for the proposal was a suggestion that COVID-19 could only be introduced by a new resident, a visitor or a staff member. And for the staff working in the homes, we had serious concerns that this was introducing a blame culture at a time when staff had already huge anxieties and were dealing with unprecedented challenges. The guidance provided for nursing homes in relation to visitors was not updated between the 17th of March and the 27th of April on the PHA website, despite numerous requests from the RCN and Unison and GMB for clarity and direction. It must be noted that most homes used their own initiatives and restricted visitors at the outset, and, that, and they attracted criticism for doing so. Um, the, proposed, the proposal described self-isolating for 48 hours uh, prior to commencing living in these arrangements. Um, there wasn't 
uh, an understanding of the scientific basis for the 48 hours. We didn't understand where that came from. Um, And clarity was also required on where the self-isolation would take place and if staff would be paid during self-isolation. We were concerned that um, how... It was unclear how the care homes had been identified for participation in the pilot. Um, And um, it wasn't clear to us how they had been um, chosen. We did talk about the testing being pivotal in the proposal um, and and should be in all (coughs) nursing homes as they sought to protect patients and staff. Several of our members working in homes had already raised concerns that they had no access to testing or carrying out testing. And there was concern about the accuracy of results. The proposal did not indicate if any consideration had been given to the mental and physical well-being of staff and how they would rest, exercise and relax. Um, There had been no exploration around enhancing PPE or uh, comparing how the spread of infection had been managed in hospitals um, as opposed to the nursing homes. And could an influencing factor in patient outcomes be better access to CTE? testing or isolation, such as the model in hospitals. The proposal uh, indicated that Four Seasons Healthcare had identified a number of homes. We didn't know how they'd been selected and whether any HSC trust facilities had also been approached for inclusion in the pilot. Uh, Any plans to implement significant change to models of care invariably benefit from full engagement with the trade unions and professional organisations representing the staff to deliver new ways of working. We find it regrettable that the Department of Health chose not to engage with our organisations at an early stage of the development of the pilot and, and then presented us with an unrealistic timescale for commenting on the proposals. This isn't within the spirit or the letter of partnership agreement. Further to the submissions of concerns, the RCM were then asked to participate in a meeting with members of the nursing team at the department, along with representative of Four Seasons Healthcare. The RCN agreed to take part in the meeting and four members of the team, two of whom have extensive experience of the nursing home sector, participated. Although some of the concerns had been addressed, we remain concerned that a full risk assessment had not been completed in order to identify potential risks to patients, staff and residents. It was on that basis that RCN, Unison and GMB determined they were unable to support the pilot in its current form. We also raised a number of concerns about the standard and appropriateness of the accommodation proposed to be offered to staff not least the suggestion they could stay in a mobile home in the car park of the care home. However, we were prepared to discuss staff being accommodated in nearby biosecure hotels, thereby reducing the risk to patients, residents, and supporting the mental and physical health of staff involved in the pilot. It must be noted that during the pandemic, hotel accommodation was offered to staff working within the health and social care sector and it is unthinkable that staff working within care homes would be offered anything less than an equivalent standard of accommodation. We were also aware that the likelihood, because of the ethnic composition of the independent sector workforce, that a large number of BAME staff would be involved in the pilot. We were concerned about the potential risk to their health, given the emerging evidence that BAME staff are particularly susceptible to healthcare infections and deaths as confirmed by the Public Health England report, 2nd of June 2020. It was not clear from the pilot submission what the associated learning would be. Indeed, it was agreed at the meeting there would be neither a plan for nor a capacity to roll out this initiative beyond the pilot phase. Therefore, we were unable to identify what learning would be derived from the pilot that would justify the potential risks to patients, residents and staff. During the discussion, we identified ways that risks to patients and residents and staff could be mitigated. These included increased numbers of cleaning staff to ensure constant cleaning of communal areas, handrails and bathrooms, in areas where patients and residents were unable to adhere to social distancing or isolation. We requested when a patient has tested positive for COVID-19 and has isolated for 14 days, they should be retested before discontinuing isolation. We asked for increased number of staff 
to help patients maintain social distancing and keep them occupied and safe. We ask for better quality and more readily available personal protective equipment um, to ensure appropriate and timely changing and disposal. We, we suggested that facilities would be available to provide uh, laundry um, facilities for staff uniforms within homes and the provision of scrubs to enable regular uniform changing. The RCN uh, Unison and GVMB hope that this summary of our position in relation to care home pilots has been helpful. As you know, we considered, con sub submitted these concerns to the department and we have already provided our submissions to you. We have, throughout the pandemic, highlighted the need and supported moves to address the impact of COVID-19 upon nursing and residential care homes. This particular initiative, however, did not appear to offer any resolution to these issues and bore the hallmarks of initiatives that had been ill-conceived and not thought through. On this basis, the RCN, Unison and GMB were unable to endorse the participation of our members. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. And I'll, I'll go then back to the panel for the more broader concerns or issues around care homes, please, and then we'll go into questions and answers with members. If I could start with that, and I'll call on John Patrick then, uh, if he uh, wants to add to this. Uh, basically, social care has been the poor relation in the health service. Um, and we have to throw down a challenge now to the department this sector needs much greater regulation. We would prefer public provision. We live with the reality of secured services and outsourcing. So regulation is absolutely essential, not just with the practice of care, but with the regulation of organizations who provide it. If you can have regulation of public utilities like water and electricity, Surely you can look at social care in the same way. It's of crucial importance that this happens. There should be regulation as well on the margin of profit. We should stop the profiteering that's happening, and it is happening in some of the providers within Northern Ireland, and their names have been in the public arena. There should also be a regulation of the market, for procurement are these fit organizations to be providing such care. So we believe that these issues have to be absolutely central to any strategy going forward, together with the right of workers to organize and bargain collectively, and the need to raise not only care standards, but also the standards of employment for the workers. Thank you. Thank you. And I invite Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. Um, very, very brief, because I know members want to want to get on to their questions. I think um, it'd be worth reflecting on the fact that we had a report back in 2017, Power to People. Um, it made numerous proposals around reform of adult social care more generally, uh, including both uh, home care and, and nursing homes. Um, and there was structures set up off the back of that. There was a reform board that, that I have taken part in on behalf of Unison over the last number of years. More recently, we've, we've seen the minister, um, I think, which has been welcome. He's acknowledged the concerns that our members would have had around things like a lack of proper sick pay, um, around generally low pay and poor terms and conditions across, across the sector. And Anne, is, Anne, is, Anne has already referred to the lack of the lack of recognition of trade unions and, and, and generally the, the lack of collective bargaining within the sector. So I think all of these issues have to be addressed if we're going to have a much more stable workforce moving forward, and that's very, very important in terms of COVID as well. And we should be mindful about the potential for a second surge of COVID, and, that, and as this committee will be acutely aware that COVID is not going anywhere in the short to medium term. So the reform of social care is not something we think that can be postponed. Um, it's something that needs to be progressed. The minister has indicated that he's, that he's going to bring forward proposals on that. Um, I think going back to our earlier session, there needs to be engagement on those proposals. There has been a, a, a project board that has done some work. That project board was stood down as a result of the pandemic. And certainly from the, the trade union's perspective, we would have a number of proposals that we would want to see implemented in any reform process, and Anne has already alluded to them, around um, 
a much more transparent and ethical uh, commissioning and procurement process when a decision is made to outsource the services. And clearly our ambition is that we would see this as a public service and move it back into the public, public sector. Okay. Thank you. And I suppose just um, it, it, is, it is true to say that we have taken a, a great deal of interest in, in this entire area around the protection from, from a very early stage of, of the pandemic. Um, we have expressed concerns around the provisions being made for care homes. We have, uh, and, and we do acknowledge some of the good work that you have just mentioned there, John Patrick, in relation to dealing with, with some of these issues, um, some of them belatedly, but welcome none, nonetheless. Um, but in terms of <coughs> testing, in terms of PPE, in terms of the discharge policies, and I was absolutely astonished to find that on around the, the end of April, uh, trusts were being um, instructed to go ahead with discharge into care homes, even where people were, were COVID positive, while there was some capacity in the hospitals. So I think that is that is something that is of grave concern. It's one of the key issues that we need to apply learning to in terms of any uh, additional surges or spikes in this, so that we can indeed do much better. I think also just listening to Rita's, um, Rita setting out the issues around the safe at home, actually almost acts as a case study in how not to do something. And, and the, the idea that you don't consult with those who have specific expertise because of a lack of time actually is, in my, in my eyes, counterintuitive because you then lose time in picking up on the issues. So I think had unions been involved from an earlier stage, you could have raised those issues which you're uh, uniquely experienced in, in, in representing your members on. So I just think in general that that, that idea of getting a wider base of discussion, of expertise and of input is always a good idea. So I suppose in relation, my, my question before we go to members, and, and we're going to be here sort of looking at a maximum of 12.45, so I'd ask members and panel just to bear that in mind for, for their answers. But in relation to a, a concern that, that was raised on many occasions around the, the, uh, the BAME issue, or around people who are, who are maybe uniquely vulnerable to the impacts of this disease, has there been any progress to report in that in terms of a policy or a strategy to protect those who may, those workers who may be uniquely vulnerable, has that been progressed to any great degree? Uh, could I say, Chairman, yesterday we got a document from the RQIA. Actually, we didn't get it. We got a copy of what was sent to independent providers, and it makes links to general advice. But we don't believe it's based on any real analysis or data. Rita might want to comment more on that. It did come up as a discussion we had ourselves yesterday. Okay. Yes, Anne, if I, if I, I could answer. Um, RQIA sent um, an email to um, home managers and providers and basically referred them to the... Um, what's on the PHG website around BAME and basically talked about um, ensuring that they were um, risk assessed. However, it must be noticed that small independent homes, nursing homes, etc., do not have access to the, the same uh, facilities as trusts do in terms of risk assessment, um, identifying risk and being able to do things like um, provide higher levels of PPE or to redeploy um, members to a different part of the organization to reduce risk. So it is concerning that the one-size-fits-all approach to BAME within our nursing home sector has been um, taken. And it's something that we haven't been involved in, but we will be very clear that we need to be involved in moving forward because the same facilities aren't available to the staff within the small care home. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go firstly to Pam Cameron, our Deputy Chair. I'll then go to Orlea Flynn on the phone and I'll then go to members in the room as per indications. So we'll go across now to Pam. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank the panel again for your attendance here. Um, just on the outset, declaring interest, I have a family member who works in the care sector. Um, <coughs> could I just ask um, if the unions carried out a, a staff audit to gauge the appetite to take part in the Safe at Home pilot initiative, um, first and foremost, and uh, do you have any um, 
evidence of, of staff members who have gone ahead and voluntarily decided to move into care homes and, and, and are they receiving res support if so? And then my second um, question was, uh, you raised the issue specifically around um, how care homes were selected for the pilot. Could you tell us what the specific issue you had in terms of needing that information of how particular homes were being selected for the pilot? Uh, Chair, if I could check yeah. if Alan is on the line, Alan Perry. Yes, I'm here, Alan, yep. Okay, well, Alan, I'll make an initial comment and then I'll ask you to respond to the member's question. Um, we didn't conduct an audit of those staff who are in membership of our respective organisations uh, without having a concrete proposition to put to them. I'm not aware of any staff who have participated in a a similar project as an individual care home initiative. Remember what we said earlier, we don't, some of those doors are closed or those staff may not be our members. So Alan, I'd like to ask you to respond. Yeah, um, thanks Anne, uh, and obviously thanks for the question. In, in relation to doing an audit, um, I think it was pretty clear from the outset that it was our members who actually made the trade unions aware that this particular pilot was actually in the domain uh, and were, were asking serious questions around having to be forced, in their, that's their words, to, to obviously partake in this pilot, which would involve them staying in the home uh, for a period of seven days. So again, I think it was very difficult uh, for us, given the timeline. Uh, this happened on a Monday, uh, and then we had a a conference call with Four Seasons on the Tuesday to get a wee bit more of an insight. And then we obviously responded during the course of that week to, uh, to the department in, in relation to our submission. So to carry out an audit, I think, uh, at that moment in time would have been totally uh, impossible given the, the restrictions uh, that were placed where we couldn't enter into the home. And, and certainly, I'm not aware within the two homes that had been earmarked uh, from four seasons that there was members willing to take part in it. I think they, if they were looking to take part, they certainly were looking more clarification and more information as to what the rule actually involved. Uh, Anne, may I answer? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is that Rita? Uh, Rita, yes. Yes, yeah. um, yes go ahead. Yes. Rita. Just to say that the RCN have an independent sector network um, as one of our networks, and the ma nursing home managers um, work with us every week and we we asked them their opinion on it and they um, agreed with our concerns so they were consulted on that and they did agree with our concerns okay. thank you um, i'm then going to go across to orlea flynn on the phone there are you there orlea i am thank you chair um my first question is one of the speakers that mentioned that the department of health um chose not to engage at you know an early enough stage about their proposals. Um, so I just wanted to ask, when did the unions actually first become aware um, of, of this idea for this pilot? And then my second question is just more broadly um, around social care in, in general, if the Minister or the Department has shared any proposals um, with any of you on future reform. Um, we know that the, the part of people development was shelved um, because of Brexit. Um, and I was just wondering, do you think that the Department um, has a different approach to, to social care reform now. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, could, could I clarify that we did receive a copy uh, of a proposal, very detailed, from um, the, the CNO and the head of uh, social policy, uh, social care at the department. What we were presented with was a a finalised proposal which we could comment. So we weren't involved in the co-design or co-production. Uh, we did present our finalised comments, which was a critique as outlined by Rita and uh, endorsed by the three organisations. And on foot of that then, the department first of all went silent 
and then decided to withdraw the particular proposal to the two care homes and the one employer that was Four Seasons and right to all care homes. Could I just come in there, Steve? Yes, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, thank you. Just obviously to answer the, the member's question, um, like I said previously, we found out uh, purely from uh, a number of frantic phone calls from our members to say that the home manager was indicating and compiling a ROTA system uh, within one of the homes that was going to uh, start the, the, the following week. So it was clearly, I think that was on a, on, on a Monday, uh, and the pilot was due to begin allegedly the following Monday. Um, so we, we purely found out for, from our members on the ground uh, prior to any uh, discussions with the, the employer or the department. Could I maybe just chair? Thank you, yes. John Thank you, Chair. Just on the second part of the question about the overall reform piece. Um, so, as, as I mentioned, um, there were structures set up by the department after Power to People was, was published. Um, that was I, in, in 2018, as I recall, in early 2018. There were a number of different meetings of, of various work streams to look at specific proposals. Uh, there, there have been numerous papers prepared by the department prior to Minister Swan coming in coming into post. I think it would be fair to say, certainly as far as I am aware, there, there's never been a, a final set of proposals that we have seen around how, how the recommendations within Power to People, particularly in terms of the workforce, will be, will be taken forward. So, as I mentioned earlier, the Minister has made some very welcome statements where he's recognising the concerns that are there about low pay, about terms and conditions, about the sick pay, specifically in the context of COVID. Um, what we don't have sight of yet is uh, specific proposals about how he intends to deal with that moving forward and how the system will reform itself to deal with that. And I think that's really the, the kind of engagement we, we need to have um, moving forward because we certainly would, would we, we proposed a bargaining forum um, to try and go through some of these issues around things like um, the procurement of services because our concern previously has been where services have been procured from uh, the independent sector around things like domiciliary care. It seems to have been done very much on a cost basis and quality and terms and conditions for the workforce have been at the expense of that. So those issues need to be need to be very, very, very much dealt with going forward. Um, so I think it is the need for specificity in this area is, is really, really important about what's intended moving forward. I don't think we got to that stage in terms of the reform project that the department had initiated and which then was halted in its work because of COVID. Thank you. Um, I'm going then to Oh, sorry, I'm going back to Pam very quickly. I'm, uh, Pam had an additional point on our... Yeah, Chair, it was just uh, on my second question, which was asking uh, what the specific issue was for the unions in terms of which care homes were being selected for the proposed pilot, and what, what were those issues? Yeah, over to the panel there, please. Uh, Rita, I'd ask you to come in on that. Okay, I don't think um, we objected to a particular home. It yeah. was the conduct of the project itself. Yeah, um, just to say, we didn't object to any particular home. We objected to the fact that A, we hadn't been <clears throat> informed, but we didn't understand and they weren't able to be clear about the criteria they had used to pick these three homes. So for example, we wanted to know about layout. We wanted to know about, um, they were talking about accommodating staff within the home. We wanted to know what criteria they had used to identify that the home would be um, appropriate to house staff overnight. And that was why we um, had difficulty. It wasn't that there was any specific home or homeowner or, or um, organisation we had the objection to. Okay. Not useful, thank you. Thank you. Jerry? Yeah, thanks again, panel. Uh, just in, reg in regards to the car homes, um, I think, Anne, you said about there's a concern about profiteering in, in the private sector. I, I would share that, uh, those concerns very much so. Um, and there's a concern that people I speak to about uh, safety concerns being raised and either no inspections happening or inspections happening or, and no punishment uh, happening uh, to the car homes, uh, the private ones. Um, and I would imagine that if some of the concerns were raised about um, the union's uh, members, then I, I, I would guess that those people would probably be disciplined um, 
and, and you know um, possibly fined and, and whatnot for f some of the issues. So, is there a concern that there's one law for how workers in car homes are treated and how the uh, operators and the owners uh, of car homes uh, operate, especially the, the larger ones? Um, well, I think the delivery of bad service, bad care has to be challenged and there have to be penalties in any circumstances where that occurs. There is a problem with compliance and there is a problem with monitoring and, if you like to use the word, the policing of the of, of the sector, and that is something which I think lawmakers and policy uh, needs in the department have to address. Um, the word punishment, uh, well, there are penalties that can be applied, withdrawal of a contract, fines, etc. Uh, that's something which would be part of a future discussion. But um, most certainly, there are, there are undoubtedly employers who think it's one law for them, and it's another law for the workforce who, who you know, are submitted to grievance and disciplinary procedures, and often in a very difficult and intimidating environment. Now, if a sector of employers open themselves up to scrutiny by allowing land collective bargaining, the good standards, the good practices, which we know do exist among a, a number of employers, will become visible. Perhaps they'll influence their peer group to <laughs> improve themselves. But collective bargaining and trade union organization always gives exposure to any of these issues. And it, it's something, it's a a right as far as we're concerned and um, a means by which workers can be protected and uh, bad practices can be rooted out and bad employers can be challenged. Thank you. Okay, um, okay members, uh, I suppose I would like to, that draws our session to a close. Um, sorry, oh, go ahead, Paula. Uh, no, sorry, uh, I didn't realise you were looking at it. Oh, apologies. Um, yeah. No, I just had a, a, well, I had a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll go to the, the primary one then. And I think maybe it would be for yourself, John Patrick, to respond to, because you were talking about the care homes going forward in the future. Um, during the pandemic, we have seen the vulnerability of our wonderful hospices because of the, the lockdown and the inability to fundraise. As we know, they have to provide 50% of the cost for palliative care for the beds. I'm just wondering what role you would see the care homes playing in the future going forward in terms of acute palliative care, since there's such a shortage in the system. I think that's a very Im important question. I think, in a way, probably the reform project around social care will in of itself have to take account of the fact that the COVID pandemic is now there and other aspects of, of care, be it uh, the work of carers or the work of, the, or the work of palliative care, or the work of um, community and voluntary providers will undoubtedly have been very drastically affected by that. I think the concern um, that we have had throughout this has largely been to do with the fact that um, you already had a workforce right across the board, um, which was generally undervalued underpaid, um, largely overworked, and there was, there was poor standards across the sector, and that was leading to an awful lot of churn in terms of the workforce. I can't necessarily speak specifically of the palliative sector, but generally across social care, there was, there was this churn that is referred to, people moving between different providers based on their ability to earn a little bit more money, and often very, very small additional amounts of money through working for different providers. So I think, particularly post-COVID, there's, there's an imperative there because of COVID to try and standardise things across the sector, to have much better pay across the sector, much better terms and conditions, so we don't have a workforce that is moving frequently between, between different employers. And I think the sick pay element has kind, of, has kind of fed into that. That was always a concern amongst our members. And, and again, we, we talked about the impact on, on BA, BAME workers earlier on. You had a, a cohort of workers there who could find themselves in financial hardship if they, they self-isolated because they were only on statutory sick pay. I mean, longer term, if we're going to deal with COVID properly in social care, we can't put workers in that position. So 
I think generally there needs to be, and I think there is now the recognition at the ministerial level that this sector needs really fundamental reform in terms of the workforce, and the workforce needs to be much more substantively valued. Um, what that means in practice and what that means in substance, I think we need to be we need to be cited on and inform, and that will go to areas like palliative care, where, as you say, they're in a more unique position where they have to fundraise in part for their activities, and that probably goes to the broader conversation that's relevant to social care as well about how we deliver these services and how they're funded. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that's an issue for health more generally, but you know I think COVID-19 has shown us, if we didn't know already, how important good social care is across the board. Um, and a concern that we would have had from the very early days of from when Power to People was published was there seemed to be sort of a planning assumption that there wasn't going to be more money for social care. Um, I don't necessarily know if that's a safe assumption to make going forward because there will need to be more resource to enable things like better pay and better better terms and conditions and to make sure that the, most importantly that the public gets a very very good standard of care and when we talk about rebuilding HSC services I think it is something that potentially um, within the minister's document possibly warranted a little bit more attention as well there, there has been a focus on the on the acute side and that's understandable but certainly going forward um, we have to think very, very carefully about, about how social care is handled because that could be, as we've seen over the last number of weeks, where COVID in particular may, may surge again. Okay, thank you. Oh. Sure, it's Rita here. Can I ask just one thing? Yes, Rita, go ahead. Uh, it's just, I suppose, to make a plea that in any discussions we have around social care, nursing homes, care homes, etc., that we um, identify that workforce issues are... are implement or are impacting severely on care homes. Uh, care homes find it very difficult to recruit and retain registered nurses, for example. Um, the terms and conditions within the health service are much more favourable. Mm -hmm. uh, there are issues and concerns about um, the um, health care support workers and the amount of money that they are paid concert, compared with supermarkets, etc. So I think we need to be very clear that without a proper well-trained workforce um, and a strategy to ensure we can look at recruitment and retention in this area, we will we will fail in our um, attempt to improve um, the delivery of care for older people within these areas. So the workforce is key. The right people with the right skills in the right place at the right time. Um, and any any model looking at workforce planning must include the independent sector. Okay. Sorry, sir, could I come in? Yes, go ahead, Alan. Thank you. It's just obviously to echo what my two colleagues have said previously. And I think one thing that stands out for me through all this here is the word front line. Um, that particular uh, phrase has been uh, mentioned on numerous news channels, uh, numerous meetings that we've, we've all attended and watched. But the very fact that you have care staff who have now, over the past number 12, 13 weeks, been on that front line on the majority of them, if not them all, on national minimum wage, um, I think actually speaks volumes of the work that they actually do. And I think an overall, that there needs to be, um, what do you call it, a, a, a complete review of the independent care sector as a whole. Also, one aspect I think needs to be touched on is the training of these people. You know, for those people who work in these homes, they, they, they carry out an assessment online. That, in my view, is not the way for, for somebody to have adequate training uh, to carry out a role that, that, that they do. So I think there's numerous of things that we need to look at, and it's important that we all have a part to play, and we're all playing that part together. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you, panel, for presenting to us and briefing us this morning on these issues. I think we have all developed a much more acute uh, understanding of the nature of essential workers, many of, many of which you represent among you, um, and, and those workers who have been so hard-pressed over this entire period of time. And I think on behalf of the committee, it's an opportunity for us, just through you, to thank uh, your, your frontline workers, all the staff you represent, and yourselves for the for the important work that you are doing and have been doing in relation to this. Um, 
and, and I know the committee had actually would had sought to engage with yourselves at a much earlier stage, and we recognise the vital the vital role that you play within the entire health and social care system. I also think there is now a heightened awareness of the, the vital need for good public health and social care in terms of pandemic preparedness and, and that gaps have been exposed and, and things lessons can be learnt and should be learnt. And we certainly would hope to engage throughout, throughout our time in terms of how we value, how we support and how we develop that workforce. So I just want to wish you all the best and thank you once again for your time here today and to wish you well in the time ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. On behalf of all our participants, um, I want to thank the committee for the goodwill you've shown to allow a number of us participate. Uh, we are a very big movement uh, of people and uh, 60,000 workers in the health and social care uh, workforce and you gave us an opportunity to speak and we're very conscious of the scrutiny work that you are doing. We follow you very closely and we wish you well in your future deliberations. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Members, um, we, are, we do have a significant amount of, of work to continue on with here and it's going to be, I'd say, I'd suggest at least an hour. So I think we are going to have to take a shortish break. But could I maybe suggest that members come back at five to five to one to resume there? Do we try to get that with the business? So we're back here for five Sorry, to just, one. Yeah, Thank you. Where it cuts across with another meeting, so I know I'm going to have to go to the economy ad hoc at one thirty. So, sure. Can I quickly? Is there any chance that when we come back we take the LCM discussion? Yeah, I think that first? would be useful because it's up in the assembly on Tuesday at in the plenary. Yeah, I'm happy to. to so I think it's that. briefings yeah. after that, isn't it? I think. Uh, can we can we accommodate a briefing if we need it in in that sort of time frame, Clerk? Um, certainly, um, we can move our agenda item. Um, we just need to check uh, officials. We're going to be up for the other items if they're here, if they don't mind, um, just in case you wanted to ask them in for questions. So I think I think that we should be able to manage that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we'll we'll see you back here at, at twelve fifty five. Thank you. Thanks. List. Okay, welcome back, members. Um, members, we're going to go to item 11, the Legislative Consent Memorandum, and we will then return to item 8 and continue the meeting from item 8. But we're going to discuss uh, initially here the Legislative Consent Memorandum, Medicines and Medical Devices Bill. I refer members to tab 11 of your table papers, the draft report on the Legislative Consent Memorandum. Do members have any comments or questions on that draft report? Yes, Chair. Just a comment, Chair, just on the report. Uh, it was um, welcome and thanks for that. But I just, I'm concerned that, um, I'm trying to get the exact word in here, um, that is a complicated field to try and get a comprehensive list of what uh, is um, uh, devolved authority and what's not. So I, I think it's hard for a committee and certainly for me as a member make a decision if we don't have that detail so I don't know if that's too um, because of the, the speed of things the speed at which we're moving through things it's it's difficult to get but I just it's it's concerning from, from my end at that point okay thank you Paula um it's it's really just a question to see whether um, Northern Ireland would continue to fall in effect under the remit of the European medicines agency it's really just a bit of clarity around that okay and um, I'll just take a couple of views from other members first. Uh, I'll check with Orlea on the phone there. Orlea, do you have anything, comment or question wise on that legislative consent mo memorandum? No, thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, should we ask for Cathy to come in just in relation to that? Uh, well, Cathy Harrison is here and is able to maybe address those issues. We'll ask Cathy to address that issue and then we'll come back to, to our own considerations. So if we could ask Cathy to join us, please. And I'll bring you in then, Paula, just to ask that question, to re reframe it, rephrase it. Chair, are you speaking on this next week? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Is there anyone else? Or? Um, I think about half an hour has been allocated. So. Uh, here you go, Kelly. 
So I'd just like to welcome Ms Cathy Harrison, Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, to our committee this morning, uh, taking questions in relation to the Legislative Consent Memorandum. And I'll go to uh, Paula Bradshaw. Thank you. Um, welcome, Cathy. It's really just a quick question, really, in terms of the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol, and um, to ask, will this mean that Northern Ireland will continue to fall in effect under the remit of the European Medicines Agency? Okay. So the North, under the, well, first of all, the Northern Ireland Protocol, as currently drafted, um, we believe will have significant implications for the use of medicines in Northern Ireland and that will have an impact on supply and regulation, etc., potentially. Okay, um, currently, there is a high level of uncertainty around how the Northern Ireland Protocol will be interpreted and implemented. Okay. And at this moment in time, I mean, this work is really, really active. So, you know, with our work, you'll appreciate that myself and my team and also the wider health teams across the UK have been very occupied with COVID. And now attention has moved back on to more normal business where we can and we are in a position to start to look more detail now at some of the EU exit implications for medicines and I have to advise the committee there are a number of issues that we are that we believe we will be dealing with in terms of medicines in terms of our position with the Northern Ireland Protocol um, I think that it's fair to say it's going to be fairly complex issues and I really would appreciate sort of you know us been able to come back to you in more detail with a lot as we work through those because at this moment in time we are actually working through the issues with DHSC and it's very important that DHSC work with us closely on these matters in the coming weeks and months so it is incredibly active currently and there are issues and there are issues that we can see but a lot of them are hypothetical at the moment so we could you know we can get into uh, potential risks um, so relating to divergence between uh, GB ultimately and EU, etc. But it's hypothetical. It's not that helpful. I would prefer to work through those now in detail with my DHSC colleagues in the next few weeks and come back to the committee with uh, more risk-based analysis around our position. We are different to GB. Um, I mean, in terms of this bill, however, I mean, this bill is the vehicle to allow us in Northern Ireland and the department to make changes to human and veterinary medicines um, after transition, legislation after transmission, and it actually allows us to maintain the powers we already have. I understand it was difficult on the phone last week. Uh, everyone finds that difficult, and everything we're dealing with is complex. Uh, but, but this bill would, uh, without this bill, at the end of the transition period, we wouldn't have the power to change our own legislation as we have currently, and we would need to develop our own bill if we don't go with the, um, you know, jointly. With, with the UK, um, so we really would recommend move ahead with the bill. In a way, it allows us to continue with what we've already got in our powers, uh, whilst at the same time considering the much bigger issues around us in respect of the Northern Ireland Protocol and EU legislation and how we will be impacted on that in Northern Ireland, which are very significant concerns for us at the moment. Are you saying that there are additional issues to the bill, separate from and additional to the bill, that the bill itself deals with some of the issues and then there I think the bill itself can be seen as separate. The bill, bill it's at this moment in time is actually allowing us to maintain the powers we currently have. And it's simply because the, the ability that we have to change our own legislation, either ourselves here through subordinate legislation ourselves in Northern Ireland or jointly with UK, as we often do, um, we won't have those powers after transition because they're included in the EU cl the clause 2.2. That will fall. So now the bill replaces that. So it is, it's almost like, um, I don't want to be flippant, it's almost like a lift and shift for us in terms of this partic these particular powers. They are distinct from the wider issues. These are, these are also important because they will allow us, they allow us a level of agility with our own national, to stay in line in terms of our human and veterinary medicines with national policies. Um, and that's where I got into last week and I know it wasn't help, always helpful at times I got into some examples to help and it complicated things but that's where I said things about prescribers in the UK, why it's important that a nurse prescriber and England, Scotland and Wales can do the same as in Northern Ireland and that's why it's important that we maintain parity and we allow the we allow this the bill would give us exactly the same powers as we've got currently. And then outside of that are other issues that we need to consider around EU exit Northern Ireland protocol 
which we, we are coming to and we will come back to the committee on. Okay. Well, well, I think that's useful and, and I, I, I know that you used the word risk, but in some ways I think that if they, we remain part of that um, medicines agency, European medicines agency, that, we, that there are opportunities for our pharmaceutical industry here. Obviously, it, it is a big employer and um, contributes greatly to our economy here. So I wonder if that's something we as a committee then need to be engaging with the pharmaceutical sector going forward in terms of the implications of how this um, LCM will actually impact their ability to trade better and easier within the European Union. So I suppose that's for us as a committee. Um, Colin? Yeah, thank you. I suppose I'm just trying to think of, of just the process, you know, so if, we, if we're going to agree with the LCM next week, effectively the bill gives you the ability, or the law currently gives you the ability to do things, you need this next week approved to let you continue doing that and beyond the extension date, but just the whole process of Brexit is going to throw up a series of issues, but you need the LCM in place to be able to allow you to respond to those issues, and um, is that right? So it's not that... The, the issues come as a result of approving the LCM. That's yeah, the, the, the bill is needed to allow us to maintain um, the powers that we currently have. So it's, it just means that nothing will change in terms of the ability for us in Northern Ireland to influence our own human and veterinary medicines. Uh, we often do that in line with, our, with the, the other um, UK countries, but we can also do it ourselves. But that will allow us to do that. Um, yeah. Other issues relating to EU exit, we will we will deal with. And that's we'll separate to, to the actual it's, it's, bill, uh, in a sense. Uh, I mean, there may be think, there may be changes to that we make to our own legislation in the in the UK as a result of EU exit in due course. Mm -hmm. But um, the, it is it's, it is separate yeah. at this moment in time. So this the bill is distinct in allowing us to maintain the powers we currently have. And, and we will come to those other EU issues. Um, you know. yeah, and, I, and I think the complexity and the um, significance of all of these issues speak to the, the need for us to have the maximum time available to apply that, mm -hmm. that scrutiny or whatever, but that is helpful. Um, I'll just quickly check if Arlea is on the phone and if she has anything in relation to this before I check back with the room. Arlea, are you there? No, I'm content, sure. Okay, thank you, Arlea. So if there's no other questions for Cathy now at the minute, I'll let Cathy step out again for a few minutes and we'll continue our consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cathy. Okay, members. Um, any other views, members, or any other issues that members wish to raise or discuss or comment? Can I just check? Is it just a normal debate next week? Like, do you speak for five minutes, or what way is it? Legislation, I think, isn't it? So you can speak because as long as you want. want. Even though there's half an hour down. Uh, Clerk, you have. It's usually indicative timing. Yeah, usually there's no uh, specific restriction on time yeah. in debates on legislation. So we we'll go on for an hour if want. Could theoretically, but okay. that's subject to members want okay. having a lot to say about. <laughs> Sorry, can I just check? I think did we pick the wrong one there? It's not the LCM that's coming up next Tuesday. It's the medic, uh, medical what LCM for medicines and medical devices. Is that what that was? That was what we just did. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'll bring in the clerk there, please. Yes. This is your draft report um, at tab 11 in your table papers in relation to the legislative consent motion on medicines and medical devices bill. Yeah. Okay, Colin, so it is the med medicines and medical devices, LCM, yeah. So well, we, we have essentially two options, whether to come to a view or not. We can come to a view and uh, propose that we sign off the report, or we can say that we, ha due to the length of time of scrutiny, we haven't arrived at a view, but we can still address the issues that we have engaged with the department around. Am I right in saying that, Clerk? Yes, Chair, the, the committee has the option to just set out its consideration, set out, the, as the draft report does, the issues you raised last week. Obviously, you've had a little further clarity today, so um, it will be a question of trying to sign off the report, whether you decide that you want to come down for, against, or neither. It will be a question of trying to agree it by email tomorrow, if possible. Um, the, um, the Agriculture and Environmental and Rural Affairs Committee are also considering it this morning and may... Um, they'll notify us as soon as possible whether they intend to raise any further issues 
so we want to include that. But the, the more urgent question for the committee is whether you would like the report to come down in favour of the motion against the motion, or whether you wish to represent that you didn't feel you had enough time to consider it fully. So there's three. Uh, Jerry Forst, sorry, indicated. Yeah, Chair, sure, I'm not going to oppose it or propose it would do, but just to repeat, um, I think it's a bit concerning that we're asked to make a decision. I understand things are moving quickly, but there's, there's a big scope of, of uh, information that we'll have no detail on. So I personally wouldn't feel comfortable you know, making a decision um, today. I'm not saying I'm going to oppose it or what, but I think it's, it's just it's very concerning that we're asked to make a decision on what we have a lot of information that's not coming forward. Okay. The, the time frame indicates we do need to arrive at one of the three decisions, so that's either to not not support, not oppose, or to uh, to to express the view that we had insufficient time and we are not. Uh, yeah, so we either. haven't been able to come to a view, but but that we have engaged with in the in the process. What do other members feel? I'm happy to support, but obviously then within the, the report that we make, um, it noted that we didn't have enough time to engage with with stakeholders, etc. So happy to go forward. Other views, members? Chair, I would, um, yeah, what Paula said, yeah, happy to support with, with that note in around the times. Clerk, what, what would the status of that be? Yeah, so that would be the committee's formal position would be that it's supporting the motion, but the, the report would set out that the committee did express concerns at the lack of time for adequate scrutiny. Are members content with that approach? Yes. I think I, I, Yes and no. I, I know what you're saying, but does that not sound a bit contradictory or, or make us diminish ourselves in some way if we say we agree to implement something but we didn't have enough information? It sound, kind of sounds like we're agreeing to something even though we don't have the full information, which might be a bit... Well, well in, that, in that case, then, we, do, we, we don't have to take a view. Either one, either we don't have to oppose it, but we also don't have to support it. We, we, can, uh, we can conclude that there was insufficient time and opportunity for us to come to a view. We can take that approach. I, th I think that's actually the approach I that I'd be most comfortable with. I know it's a bit pedantic, but I think it's just it's bad practice if we go in and say we didn't have enough information about something, but we approve of it. I think that diminishes our role, makes us look like we're agreeing with something, but we're prepared to agree with something as legislators, but we don't actually have the information. I think that's a unless there's a real heavy caveat that says that we know this has to come in to give them the power to do the other bits of piece, but I think we would need to clear it just to go in and say that we support something even though we don't have all the information is maybe just a bit... Paula? Well, I suppose what this will allow us going forward then will allow the department to proceed, but then any regulatory changes that they would be proposing going forward, they would have to come back to committee. So I think that I'm content to allow them to continue with this work. It was very clear from, from the official there that... You know, it's still a very fluid situation, and, and I suppose I don't want to hinder that work. Um, and, but I'm content that we will have enough time when the, the actual substantive changes, the regula regulatory changes, will come back to committee, and hopefully at that time will be post-pandemic, and we will have time to scrutinise the individual changes that are being proposed. I think in that, if you're saying that we're approving something that's an enabler to bring yes. further stuff back to us for scrutiny, I think then we, and we, it's the principle that we're permitting the enabler. Then uh, that, as a concept, I could support, but I just I, do, I wouldn't want us to go in and say we don't have enough information, but we agree with something. I think that sounds bad. Well, us, us not taking a view will not stop it. I'll, I'll come back to you in a second earlier. Yeah, I hear you there. Us, us not taking a view will not will not stop it from going forward, and we will still. But we we will formally not have taken a view based on based on the lack of time. But we'll not be preventing it from going forward, and we'll not be preventing further scrutiny either. Uh, or Leah. Yeah, sure. That was just the point that I. Well, that was the third option, which wasn't preventing um, it going through the, you know, the assembly chamber as long as it wasn't preventing the Department of Health doing what they needed to do. Because um, I'm just conscious, see, in our report, sorry, there's an echo coming back. I mean, it put me off speaking. Um, in the report that the committee clerk done for us, we had requested this further information from the DERA committee as well. And because it's contained within that, that we haven't received that feedback yet. You know, I suppose that will cover as well that we're, you know, just are on the side of caution in case the DR committee come back later on this afternoon and they are flagging up something of concern, then it might be too late then if we already have taken the decision to approve it. But as long as we're not doing any harm by um, you know, not approving it or opposing it, 
Yeah. So maybe the third option might be the best one. Based, based on the lack of time to apply scrutiny, the lack of time and opportunity. Well, I'll, 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 put, I'll put the proposal in just... To, so I, if, can I propose that the report concludes that there has been insufficient time and opportunity for scrutiny in order to come to a view? Are members content with that? Yeah. 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 Okay, members, members are content with that. I'm still happy to proceed, so do you want to put it to a vote? To vote. Yeah, we can. We can go to a vote. Yeah. yeah. So, Chair, sorry, just, I mean, just to quote um, Cathy Harrison's um, answers, well, her brief there, and she said that the bill was distinct to, to retaining powers that we have already. So I, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't support it as it is going forward, given that you're not saying any change now. There's obviously going to be complexities coming forward, but that they will come back to us. So. Well, for, I suppose, speaking for, for myself, the reason for me would be that there has been very little time to engage on any of that complexity, given the way it's, the way it has come to the committee. But we can put both, both proposals there and go for, go for a, a, a vote on it. And the second proposal, just for information, would be to propose that we seek to sign the report off by email after the meeting to allow incorporation of the ERA committee comments. That would be the, that would be the other the other proposal. So I'll put the first proposal first. So I propose that the report concludes that there has been insufficient time and opportunity for scrutiny in order to come to a view and members in support of that. F3, Orlea. Uh, what are you voting, uh, Orlea? Are you in, in support of that proposal? No, sure, the second proposal. In support of the second sorry, proposal, sorry. okay. Sorry, so, I didn't get all this, sorry. Uh, Jerry, Colin and I. And then I will put the second proposal the just for, for clarity. Just, have, just for clarity, the, the no's against that proposal that we conclude with insufficient The no's for that proposal yeah, is Paula, Pam, Alan and Orlea. You're a no on that? No, sorry, Chair. Uh, could, you, could you just start again, sorry? Okay. Uh, so, I propose that the report concludes that there has been insufficient time and opportunity for scrutiny in order to come to a view on this LCM. So, in favour of that proposal, show of hands please. And Orlea, are you in favour of that proposal or against that proposal? Yes, Chair, sorry, but last time around you had mentioned about waiting on further information from the DERA committee. Is that part of the proposal that you're suggesting now? No, the proposal now would... would Sorry, I'll bring in the clerk for some clarity. Just, on just for clarity, either way, uh, we will need to incorporate into the report, ideally tomorrow, some reference briefly to the ERA committee's consideration. If they have no issues to raise, that will be a single report, ideally wrapped up tomorrow and agreed by email. If, however, the ERA committee asks their clerk to go off and write up a series of issues that may take some time, we would seek to conclude our report tomorrow and do an addendum as soon as possible. It's not ideal. So it's a separate question, really. The, the primary question that the committee needs to decide upon is whether it wishes to conclude that it has had insufficient time or conclude that it supports the uh, motion, the two proposals. That and in, e in either case, we would, we would speak and we would advise the Assembly of our considerations on it. Absolutely. And we, we, would, we would state that, you know, so we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be going into the Assembly to oppose it. We would be stating that we just felt due to a lack of time, we hadn't uh, been able to arrive at a view, yep. if that's what we decide. Yeah, just to be clear, the content of the report would be almost identical, except for the conclusion. It's about, the it's about what we conclude, whether we conclude, we will, we will still complete the report, we will still deliver the report, but whether we conclude that we have not had time to arrive at a view, or we have a time to arrive at a view, and that's to support. Those are the two issues really in play at the minute. So I'll put the first proposal once more, just for clarity, okay? Okay, members, so... The proposed report concludes that there has been insufficient time and opportunity for scrutiny in order to come to a view. Members in support of that proposal. Orlea, can I check your vote on the phone? <laughs> yes, sorry, members. I'm raising my hand here in support. <laughs> phone, phone hand. So that's uh, Colin, Colin, Jerry and Orlea. The other proposal, uh, those who vote against that proposal, please. So we have four. Yeah. So... We're now in a, what is the situation now in relation to, the, do we have put the second proposal or do we have a cast and vote in relation to that first proposal? Um, and, and it, go ahead. There's Frank, no please. casting vote for the chair on this occasion. Um, normally, if it's, if it's tied, a proposal falls. In this instance, the same could happen again if you look the other way. So 
uh, we may perhaps it might be better to take a break and have some informal conversation. Yeah, our members happy to we take a take a break. So, oh. What was the third? Could we? Well, oppose. That we oppose would be the third. The third. So it would either be either be a. Uh, that we would be in favour of, against, or that we say that we haven't had time, haven't had sufficient time to arrive at a view. But here are our considerations on the matter. So, will we take a, a short break just to further uh, discuss the matter? Okay, Clerk, could you please suspend the meeting? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Okay, members, we're now going to go to a vote on the second proposal that we seek to sign off. Sign the report off by email after the meeting to allow incorporation of the ERA committee comments. So, can I ask members in favour of that? Sorry. Sorry, the Chair. Was, we need to clarify first of all: Are we? Uh, is the committee going to come down in favour of supporting the motion first, and then we'll go to how we sign off? I'm um, sorry, Clerk. I'm not sure what you mean. So, the, the next decision the committee needs to make is whether or not it wishes to support the motion. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, do, do the committee wish to support the motion? We will now take a vote on that, and we will ask for a show of hands in relation to do they support the first motion? Or they Just all those, all those in favour of the motion. All those in favour of the motion? Yep. So that's Paula. Yeah. And all those against the motion? I'm sorry, I didn't get them all. Just, just Paula, Pam, Alex, Alex and, and Alan. Alan. Yes. All those against the motion? So that's Colum, Colin, Jerry, and Orlea. Can I check your vote? Yep. Orlea, please again. Okay, Claire. I'm missing somebody there. No. We've got four against. We've got Colum, oh, Jerry, Jerry Orlea, Colin, and me. Colin. That's it. Okay, so the committee therefore has not taken a view on, on this on this LCM. Thank you. Okay, members, thank you. We are now going to revert back to item eight of our agenda. Can I just uh, committee you have to go here, okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can you retake the vote now? So I the vote. I recount. <laughs> I want to recount. <laughs> <laughs> So, item eight is SR 2020 forward slash 73, the misuse of drugs amendment regulations NA 2020. I refer members to the papers at tab eight of your pack. I can advise members that the department has made a statutory rule to facilitate dispensing of medicines during the pandemic. The department advises that the SR will relax rules on possession and supply to allow pharmacists to supply controlled drugs to patients without a prescription in two specified circumstances, to ensure continuity of care during the pandemic and to alleviate pressures on community pharmacies and GP practices. Can I remind members that the committee considered this SL1, the SL1 on the 2nd of April and agreed that it was content that the department make the statutory rule. The department advises that there has been no change to policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee. The regulations came into force on the 30th of April and are subject to negative resolution. The regulations were laid in breach of the 21-day rule, but the examiner of statutory rules has reported that she is content with the department's reason for this and has no other issues to raise. Have members any issues which they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No. Uh, are Leah on the phone? Any issues to raise? No, thank you, Chair. Okay. So, Therefore, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 73, the Misuse of Drugs Amendment Regulations 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Moving on to item 9, SL1, the Misuse of Drugs Amendment number 2, Regulations 2020. I refer members to tab 9 of your pack. The Department is proposing to make a statutory rule to amend the Misuse of Drugs Regulations NA 20, 2002 to allow for fewer restrictions on the prescribing and supply of the cannabis-based medicine Epidiolex. 
I can advise that department officials are here today to give a brief overview of the proposed SR and to respond to any issues that members may wish to raise. So I would now like to welcome Ms Cathy Harrison, once again Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, Mr Craig Allen, Head of Medicines Policy, and Mr Kenneth Ward, Medicines Regulatory Group. So, um, Cathy, could you go ahead and, and give us an update on this? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to come today to the committee to provide evidence on the SL1 relating to the misuse of drugs. Uh, amendment number two, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Um, I trust that the SL1 has provided members with the background and purpose of the amended but, amendment, but I just want to invite Canis to give a very short overview of the content. Go ahead, uh, Canis, thank uh, you. So what this amendment really seeks to do is uh, reschedule a drug called Abidialox, uh, a cannabis-based medicine from Schedule 2, to, into Schedule 5 of the Misuse of Drugs Regulations in Northern Ireland, 2002. Uh, Dialox received a marketing authorisation in September 2019 uh, for the treatment of two form, rare forms of rare childhood epilepsy, uh, lennox gastaut syndrome and Dravet syndrome, uh, for patients in two years uh, of age and older. Uh, I think, again, it's, I think it's important to note that initiation of Dialox should be uh, under uh, clinicians with experience with those conditions. Uh, rescheduling of Epidiolox follows recommendations from the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs, or ACMD, and again, I think I've said before, but there are UK a government expert body who advise UK government on the, the Assembly on uh, control of drugs that are maybe harmful or dangerous uh, or could be misused. Uh, the, the recommendation from the Council is based on, the fa on their observations that uh, Epidiolox has a low risk of diversion or abuse potential. Um, and again, the rescheduling of Epidiolox from Schedule 2 to 5 will uh, exempt it from some of the controls associated with Schedule 2 drugs under the Misuse of Drugs Regulations, so there will be less controls under that. Um, we are seeking to make this amendment in conjunction with uh, GB legislation, and we have been in regular contact with the Home Office here, bringing a similar amendment, uh, equivalent legislation in, in GB. Um, that really concludes scope of this amendment. I'm happy for any, any questions or comments. Thank you. Pam, go ahead. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to check, uh, for just for clarity, so this keeps us in line with the rest of the yeah. GB? Yes. Okay. And um, can you tell me, are there any records kept on, on the use of this particular drug and, um, you know, on the prescribing of it and any feedback on it? In terms of just of its use um, and I suppose, prominence of that use, or you know, are, are, is there any data being stored? I suppose in terms of, of its usage. And any supplies or any, any pharmacy or any hospital that makes a supply would have to keep a record of, of any drug uh, being supplied from the hospital, so there, there would be that, that data. And would there would feedback uh, on the, uh, anything transpiring from the? From, from those prescriptions going out, any feedback on I suppose, reactions or anything to that drug? Are they collected at all in terms mean, of data? Do you mean adverse incidents or adverse um, reactions? Or? Yes, I suppose, or, or either way, good or bad. Um, well, there's a UK-wide uh, adverse incident uh, recording system mm. uh, by MHRA, so any, any adverse incidents mm. would be recorded through that yellow card scheme, it's called. Um, I suppose positive. of incidents, for want of a better word, would probably not be. Um, well, they, I, I think it's significant that NICE made a decision on the use of this drug in, in the two the two rare epilepsy conditions. This is a licensed dr drug for cannabis and it has gone through clinical trials and it's also, it's, it is marketed for these specific conditions. Now, whenever, so a lot of safety data and everything would have been collected in that process during the trials post marketing authorization um, ongoing this is, uh, is saying there is ongoing surveillance of all drugs including this epidiolex happens through like a yellow card reporting systems and different pharmacovigilance systems because it's important with any new drug that we understand the benefit mm -hmm. of it and any unexpected risks especially in a, in, in a vulnerable patient group like like we have here but the numbers of prescriptions in general would be quite low 
there there would be quite a lot of interest in in you know monitoring how the patients are are, are responding. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just check with Arlea on the phone. Arlea, on this SL1, do you have any questions? No, thank you, Chair. Okay, Paula. Um, thank you. Um, it's really just around if and when this goes through in terms of the guidance for the clinicians. I know there's always been a degree of reticence amongst the clinicians because of the controversial nature of cannabis-based medicines really just about the, the guidance. Well, I suppose uh, in relation to this amendment, there probably won't. There, there will be... Will be made aware of the rescheduling, but as an all, it's already a licensed product, so there probably won't be any specific guidance. It's already being prescribed. This is just relaxing some of the restrictions upon it. So, for specific guidance on prescribing it, they would look towards NICE guidance, and you know, look, they might allude to current, other other clinical guidance. guidance still stand. Still stands. Okay. So this is okay. just about scheduling, so removing some of the restrictions around the conditions that need to be met in terms of prescribing. Them handwriting restrictions and things like that. So it's actually enabling, um, making it easier for prescribers to use, recommend this drug and have it used. But the clinical indications and the advice for clinicians in starting it remain the same. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from members? No, I don't think so. Okay, thank you once again, Kathy, Janice and thank Craig. Thanks, thank you for providing that information. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. So, members, are the committee content that the department makes this statutory rule? Yep. Content. Content. Yep. Thank you. Earlier, content on the phone. Just checking. Yes, content. Thank yep. you. Okay. Moving on then to item ten, members. SL one. The addition of vitamins, minerals, and other substances amendment regulations NI twenty twenty. I refer members to tab 10 of the pack. The Food Standards Agency is proposing to make a statutory rule to amend the addition of vitamins, minerals and other substances regulations NI 2007, which provide for the enforcement of regulation EC number 1925 forward slash 2006 on the addition of vitamins and minerals and of certain other substances to foods. Article 8 and Annex 3 of this regulation lay down requirements relating to substances where use in foods is prohibited, restricted or under community scrutiny. The FSA advises that the purpose of this amendment is to include offences and penalties for Article 8 and Annex 3. Is the committee content that the department makes that statutory rule? Yeah. Yeah. Content? Content on the phone? Content. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We'll do it. Yes, so item 11 we have dealt with members and then um, we're turning to item 12, correspondence. So can I refer members to correspondence at tab 12 of the pack and to table papers and to the correspondence memo at tab 12.1? Can I draw members' attention to a couple of items? Item 12.2 is a response from the Minister to committee correspondence on issues raised during the briefing from NIADA on addiction services. Any comments on that correspondence? No. Members. no. Uh, so members content to note? Yeah, members content, thank you. Item 12.3 is a written update from the Department on the contaminated bloods issue as requested by the committee. Any comments on that piece of correspondence? No. Members content to note? Content, thank you. Item 12.5 is a response from RQAA to committee correspondence on issues arising from the RQAA briefing on the 14th of May. Um, any comment on those members on that issues arising? Given the significance of the Cure Home issue and the ongoing work around, around all of that, I think it mightn't be a bad idea to have RQAA penciled in for a future date, maybe four or four, six weeks' time. Would members be content that we start to th schedule that in so that we, have, we can see how things are are going in that sector at that at that time. Members content with that? Yes. Yep, members content. Item 12.12 .12 is correspondence from families involved NI, highlighting the difficulty families face caring for family members with disabilities during the COVID-19 crisis and seeking the committee's support. I met with this group yesterday along with other MLAs, as I mentioned earlier, and there are a uh, 
significant areas that, that they're, they're having difficulties with to include you know, uh, the right for relatives to accompany a loved one in, in hospital and to stay with them over a period of time, which there's obviously a lot of additional stress. There are also concerns around issues with the flexibility in terms of the use of direct payments at the present time, where families are, are shielding and where carers can't, can't come and go to the house. So, but, um, so I think, I think we would, our, our members content that we acknowledge the important work that they're, that they're doing and the need for support for that, for that sector. Yeah, Chair, I think I too had a, a virtual meeting with them um, and I think it's really vital that we understand how important it is that carers, especially in hospital visits and, and that type of thing, that they are allowed access um, with the patient because often this can be patients who are non-verbal, uh, maybe with um, learning difficulties, and it can be highly, st uh, highly stressful time for those individuals and, in fact, for, for staff members who are trying to deal with that patient because quite often the carers are absolutely essential to that. So I think it's really important that that is, that that, that is raised, the importance of, of carers being uh, having that access. And I think that what, what they were asking for was more of an uh, overall policy that, that carers should be able to accompany uh, patients in, in that kind of scenario, as opposed to it being left very much to the discretion of um, hospital trust or, or staff members. Um, so I think that it is important, and I think uh, they made a very important point that that policy should be kind of defaulting to that the carers should absolutely be uh, able to attend with the patient, even in even and, and maybe especially in light of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, and I think and, and I, it struck me very, very similarly, uh, Pam. I have to say that first of all, there seem to be differences across different trusts, even within hospitals. There seem not not within hospitals, but between hospitals, there seem to be different approaches. To me, it seemed like actually more of an issue where the hospital would enjoy an additional resource mm -hmm. in terms of communication, in terms of reassurance, and that. So I, I think that was a valid a valid concern and one that that has been accentuated as a result of COVID-19, but is an ongoing issue and one that, that would... Uh, um, yes, Paula, go uh, ahead. Um, I just think the whole... It's a wee bit like the care homes themselves. Um, I think the needs, the acute needs of our carers have really come in, you know, we've really been very much more aware of them during this pandemic. So I'm just wondering, I know we've looked at sort of social care issues before, but I'm just wondering if we could maybe schedule in some um, evidence from the likes of families involved or, or even carers themselves so we can hear first-hand experience of, of the challenges because I know that a lot of them have been under tremendous pressure during this pandemic. Yeah and I think we had if memory serves right we had intended to try to have carers and I in but then as a result of the pandemic so I think that is maybe a relevant a relevant piece of work and I wonder on that issue specifically on on the issue of visiting and, and accompanying people to hospital should we should we write to the minister on that or raise it the next time he's here or should we, should we send a letter to him just to flag that issue in itself up? Chair, I, uh, if it's not already aware, I have a letter going off to the minister regardless, so I, I would support um, the committee writing as well. I know there's, there are several issues um, raised, so I think that would that would be good. And I think it's probably in, uh, well, I'm not sure if it's in any of this communication, but certainly uh, in fact, I might have actually said before the committee as well, so it'll probably come anyway. And I think it is also a useful in, in Cures Week in particular that we do reschedule back in that cure. It's a, it's a huge component of the overall uh, health and social care fabric, and and one that's uh, often and and I think this time once again one of the last to be considered and supported in, in in appropriate ways. So I think that is something that we should, if members are content with that, we should look at. Thank you very much. Okay. So, are members then otherwise content with the actions as noted in the correspondence memo? Sure. Yes, uh, Orlea, yeah. Hi, yeah, if I could just come in. Um, something um, just jumped out at me whenever I was reading through our, the correspondence in our table picks. Yeah. And I mean, no disrespect to, to the members' party in asking this question, but in, in 12.14, um, um, the, the email from Alan just about inquiring around um, the expert panel session that we had. I, I would just like to know, is it a normal process for a, a committee member to take requests from their party leadership in relation to the work of um, the committee? 
um, and to seek that type of information, including the internal and external communications. And, you know, excuse me for asking the question if, if it is a case that that's normal procedure or protocol, but it just seemed a bit, a bit strange to me. Yeah. Um... Yeah, uh, and, and uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, to be honest, um, uh, Clark. Um, any member of the committee is, of course, entitled to um, seek further information about how the committee is conducting its business. Um, strictly speaking, information given in the pack, information to members, is for their attention and their attention only. But um, it's not my. It's not the committee's business to interfere with what members choose to do with information they've received. I could just clarify, Chair. The information was requested for my own use. Okay. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, Arlene. And, and sorry, ju just for clarification, um, Alan. And again, I mean no disrespect. It was just in, in the email in our text, and it says that um, you have been asked by your party leadership. To obtain a copy of that information. Okay, um, I think I think just in general, I think the uh, I have to say I think we we did get added value from the panel. We have agreed a number of names moving forward and a number of, of additional panels. I think uh, any expertise and I think people who are coming to give us their their knowledge and expertise is something that is of value both to us and to the Minister and the Department in terms of our ability to advise, to scrutinise. So um, I, I, I certainly think that's, that's an issue. We are we're looking at, at trying to get wider involvement here for the management and for, for other things. I think, I think that's something that is certainly of value and, and I hope that we can continue to, to do that. So okay, um, moving on then. There, there other correspondence, Go ahead, Chair. Yes. Um, the correspondence from Mid and East Antrim Council, I think it's maybe, well, I have not in front of me, maybe 12.8. Uh, yeah, 12.8 Economy Committee correspondence to DOH re advice used to estate agents by Mid and yeah. East Antrim. Is that this? Um, slight concern around it. I, I, I noticed that from the 29th of May, um, they have permitted uh, viewings by state agents of vacant properties, uh, and I do see that they have built in mitigating um, uh, circumstances and protections around the, you know, the, the length of time between uh, the viewings and so forth. But um, when the uh, chief environmental officer uh, came to address us a couple of weeks ago, uh, he did. Uh, I asked him the question about who was going to police the opening of large stores and the restoration of various services, who was actually going to police it, was it still the PSNI or, or whatever, and he indicated to us that the powers had been uh, given vested in local authorities uh, to, uh, you, you know, to control and to police uh, uh, the, the, the various changes and relaxations. Um, he did ask the question then, um, how could we ensure that there would be consistency of approach by each of the 11 uh, local authorities? Uh, and he indicated to us that a special group had been created by Solis, um, made up of um, public health officers, uh, and they would uh, discuss um, you know, all, all proposals that each council was going to maybe uh, bring forward to try and ensure that you know, each council would be basically doing the same thing at the same time. Um, but this does seem to have been uh, a bit of a, a solo run. I have no particular no concern about the, the, the relaxation or, or the, the, the circumstances, just the way that it has been delivered. Um, and it worries me a little bit that in a state agent, you know, we are trying to, we're trying to provide clarity and certainty and everything else in the regulations. Um, but you will have an estate agent maybe in another part of the country uh, complaining, you know, I, I can't, my local authority don't allow me to go and, uh, and do viewings of vacant properties, but you're allowed to do it in Mid and East Antrim local council area. Um, and it's just, you know, how do you, how do you answer that, uh, you know, if there is those inconsistencies? So um, I'm not sure whether maybe we should be asking the, the chief environmental officer just that here's an example of, of, of a breakdown uh, in that consistency which he told us there was 
uh, things have been put in place to try and ensure that that didn't happen. And uh, you know, just seek their views. That is this going to be? Is this going to be the pattern going forward? Are our various councils going to do different things at different times and and just create uh, more more uncertainty? Yeah. Uh, well, I suppose first of all, we will be copied into the department's reply the, the, from the department on that. Could we maybe take a look at it again then and see what what issues remain outstanding yeah. at that point? Okay, members content then otherwise to note that and to note the other items on table papers. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Moving then to item 13, members forward work. Can I refer members to the draft forward work programme at tab 13.1 of your pack? Uh, are members content to note the forward work programme? Yep. Members content. Can I draw members' attention that we have not been able to make the arrangements to meet the minister on Wednesday, 24th? Due to the number of committees that which are already meeting on that day, but we have been offered Monday the 22nd at 3 p.m. This is the, minute, this is the additional meeting with the minister that was scheduled for the Wednesday. Mm -hmm. We could take it on the Monday before at 3 p.m. Are members content? 3 p.m. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll note that. It is subject to the executive meeting running to time, but hopefully that won't be the case. And was that chair just at what date? The 22nd, Alan, 22nd. of June. Um, it, so the executive do meet on a Monday. If it if it runs significantly over, we we will or if there was a plenary, but hopefully neither of those things will happen, and we can get that scheduled in. So members, while COVID nineteen continues to be our focus, I'd like to propose that we begin to request some written briefings on key policy areas. Hopefully, when they are ready, we may be in a position to begin to broaden our agenda. Can I suggest we initially request papers on Brexit? which is obviously out there as an issue and, and becoming relevant again, and the digital aspects of transformation, including the Encompass programme, which there have been recent announcements on. Are members content for those Thanks. items? And any other business then? Do members have a, uh, any other suggestions that members want to um, be considered in terms of forward work? We've already had the one from around CURES. Um, anything further can be brought to, to, to subsequent meetings, and members can maybe start to think about that again as time, as time goes on. Mm -hmm. Okay then, members. Any other business today? Any other business on the phone earlier? No, thank you. Okay. Okay, members. Then we are uh, down to date, time, and place of next meeting. The next meeting will take place at 10:30 a.m. on Thursday, 18th of June, 2020, in room 30. Okay, members. Thank you. Thank you very much. Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed.